Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this public meeting. Can you hear me? Welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, before we begin, I want to confirm that our AV setup is in place and we have Commissioner Kay connected by phone. So let me ask, Commissioner Kay, are you out there? I am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to hear uh, your voice. Uh, as I understand it, you cannot be here in person today because you're recovering from a medical procedure. We are thrilled to have you participating by phone and hope all is well on your end. Thank you. Today's meeting provides an opportunity for a public comment on CPSC staff's draft safety standard for crib bumpers and liners. On September 4th, 2019, the Commission was presented with a draft NPR or Notice of Proposed Rulemaking for crib bumpers that incorporates by reference the most recent voluntary standard with significant modifications intended to strengthen the standard. This is a project, to say the least, that has been years in the making and I commend staff for all of the hard work, dedication, and collaboration that went into it. To say the least, this is a project that is not without controversy and that's why we're here today. We've heard from a number of safety advocates, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, who caution against the use of crib bumpers altogether and several jurisdictions, including the state of Maryland, who've banned their sale. For this reason, the Commission decided to take public comment on this NPR before making a decision whether to publish it. This forum is intended to provide an opportunity for comment on all sides. And on that note, I would point out that CPSC staff was invited to present testimony today, but declined to do so, which is perfectly fine, indicating that staff's position on crib bumpers is reflected in the staff briefing package. That said, let me reiterate, reiterate that we greatly appreciate all of the hard work that our very talented staff has put into the package. Today, we're here to listen, to ask questions, and to try to understand the concerns on all sides of this hotly contested issue. Disagreements can often feel personal, but in this case, they really shouldn't be. I believe CPSC staff and everyone in this room shares the same goal of protecting the health and safety and well-being of children. With that said, I urge everyone to keep an open mind and to proceed in good faith. We're gonna have three panels today. I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves and each one will have up to 10 minutes to speak. We'll then have 10 minutes for each commissioner to ask questions of the panel. We plan to take a lunch break around 12.45 p.m. after the completion of the second panel. In order to stay on schedule, I'm gonna to have to enforce the time limits for both panelists and commissioners, including me. I'll do my best to each let each witness complete a final thought, but I apologize in advance if I have to cut anyone off. Uh, so uh, our first panel is Dr. Sharfstein, Dr. Moon, Dr. Hoffman, and Executive Director Nancy Coles. And Dr. Sharfstein, I invite your comments. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Chairman Adler and the other commissioners. I really appreciate the chance to be here today. Um, my name is Josh Sharfstein. I'm a pediatrician. I'm a professor of the practice in health policy and management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm the former Secretary of Maryland's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, Maryland, as you mentioned, uh, is uh, one of the states that have banned the sale of crib bumpers. We did this in 2013. I think we were the first state to do so. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about that and then go to the questions that you posed. Um, we did that not because we woke up in the morning and decided to ban the sale of crib bumpers. We actually engaged in quite an extensive process um, of consideration. This included uh, convening an advisory group of public health and pediatric experts in Maryland twice, including the chair of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins and some of the other leading pediatricians in the city. These experts voted twice uh, to advise the state to do a ban. We also had a hearing that provided the manufacturers of crib bumpers the chance to make its scientific case and have an exchange with the experts. After that, um, they again voted to recommend a ban. Um, we also had two public comment periods where we received a bunch of comments from a range of people um, uh, where they you know, expressed their views about this. And that led up to uh, quite an extensive document that we will submit as part of the record that explained everything that we looked at from the scientific literature, all the public comment that we got um, in both public comment periods, the hearings that we did, 
And uh, based on that, uh, we concluded in Maryland that there were um, known risks of these products, that they were rare, but that they were real. We also found no meaningful evidence of benefits that would justify these risks. As a result, we concluded that a ban was required to protect young children. And um, we will have more information, as I mentioned, submitted for the record. So based that, that is my primary experience with this issue. You know? um, and so based on that, I wanted to turn to the questions. One of the questions you posed was about the utility or benefit of crib bumpers. And this was something that we explored. You know, I, I have also worked at the Food and Drug Administration as the acting commissioner and principal deputy. A key question for FDA is you know, the benefit versus the harm. You know, what, what's the balance there? So you really have to ask the question about the benefit. And um, we did not find any meaningful evidence of benefits from these products, um, nor did the industry at the time present any evidence, nor do I see any credible evidence of benefits in the proposed rule that is the subject of this hearing. Um, I was kind of looking for a section that says, here are the benefits. But from my perspective, um, you're always thinking about the risks in the context of benefits, like you would for a medicine. You know, medicine can cause a serious problem, but is it giving, you know, is it saving lives too? What's the balance? And there's nothing on one side of the ledger that is uh, compelling. At the same time, there are multiple studies documenting injuries and even deaths from crib bumpers. In Maryland, we had a lot of testimony and engagement of the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, where he had uh, found that one death was directly related to crib bumpers, and he expressed concern about the role of restricted air circulation in other infant deaths. In the proposed rule, it looks like CPSC has identified as many as 83 deaths of infants related to crib bumpers. And so I think there's an important principle in product regulation for young children. Where there is no evidence of benefit, we should not accept a risk of death. Where there is no evidence of benefit, we should not accept a risk of death. And that is the principle that FDA used to uh, work with CPSC to get rid of certain infant sleep positioners. No evidence of benefit, risk of death. It's the same principle that FDA applied for cough and cold medicines for young children, which are now off the market for kids under four and had caused deaths, and there were no evidence of benefit. So where there is no evidence of benefit, you should not accept a risk of death for young kids. The second question is um, about consumer understanding. And um, here, um, the question that you pose is a kind of a subtle one, which is whether the, um, whether the, sorry, open this up. Whether the bear is best messaging um, would include crib bumpers, is it confusing? You know, um, I'm not aware of direct data about that question. I think the AAP has taken the position that um, the continued sale of these products undermines say, safe sleep messages, and you'll hear from the AAP. Um, there was, uh, but we, uh, I do want to let you know, we will submit this for the record, but I've been working with Professor Andrea Gielen, who is um, a nationally recognized expert in injury prevention from the School of Public Health, and um, she um, got from the, the Harris Omnibus Group a nationally representative poll. She got the results yesterday. I'm going to tell you a couple of the findings, and we'll submit a report as part of the record. Um, the, it, it surveyed 2,038 uh, adult respondents weighted to the entire U.S. population, including 144 parents of uh, children zero to two years. 64% of the, the parents of young kids reported having used crib bumpers. So these are products that are still being used. Um, and uh, the, the two-thirds of them said that they thought the bumpers were safe. Um, half... Uh, to 60% assume that people wouldn't be able to buy crib bumpers if they were dangerous. And I think that that's a pretty important um, finding because um, it relates to this, that I think like people assume that if something is being sold for the crib, that somebody has looked at it and said it's safe to put in there. Um, and I think therefore having them on the market does undermine any message about not using them. Um, if the vast majority of people, or at least the clear majority of people, believe that just because it's on the market, um, it is safe to use. Um, the third question you asked was about state laws. And um, I am pleased that the Attorney General of Maryland submitted comments for the record here. Um, the Attorney General's view is that the CPSC rule would not preempt what Maryland does, but this, the Attorney General um, also <coughs> said very clearly that they don't want to be litigating this with anyone. They think if the, if 
um, the commission is going to go forward, it would be very important and helpful to put a clear non-preemption provision in the rule specifically. Um, I'm not a lawyer. So what I can say is any kind of preemption would be terrible. Um, a CPSC standard that brings crib bumpers back to the market in Maryland would risk the death of infants. Um, Maryland has reached historic lows in infant mortality since we put our ban into place. Um, it was one of many factors, I believe. But it makes no sense for a federal agency charged with the protection of young children to be making it harder for states to do its job to protect young children, particularly when a state like Maryland did such a thorough process with national experts um, governing um, our decision making. Notably, Maryland's regulation provides the opportunity for the Secretary of the uh, Health Department, my position, to rescind our ban if CPSC determines that the benefits exceed the risks. Um, but that's not what the proposed rule does. And I want to turn to that as the next point. The proposed rule does not say the benefits of these products exceed the risks. The proposed rule applies a different standard. It doesn't apply the unreasonable risk of injury standard, which is the I thought was the standard that the CPSC was supposed to apply. It doesn't say, does the benefit exceed the risks. It says, can we possibly make these safer than the industry standard? Now, there's a legal question, and the Attorney General of Maryland feels that that may not be the right standard to apply at all. From my perspective, it doesn't make sense because that's a standard you would apply to something that's an essential product. You know, cars. You need cars. Cars are unsafe in all kinds of ways, but let's make them safer. You know. Um, and the part of that law that that's from is like cribs. You need cribs. Let's make them safer. If you can make it safer than the industry standard, that makes sense. But nobody needs crib bumpers. And so to apply that part of the law to this doesn't make sense. To apply a standard that would be, can we make this a little safer than the industry standard as opposed to, is this safe? Do the benefits justify the risks? Is this an unreasonable risk? Those are better standards for a product that's not necessary. And so um, this actually wouldn't trigger the Maryland provision because it's not a determination that the benefits exceed the risk. It is a sort of uh, a different standard that, in my opinion, doesn't make sense from a public health perspective. From the attorney general's perspective, it doesn't make sense as a legal perspective. Um, the last point that um, I wanted to make was about warnings. It seems like the major focus of the rule is the warnings. Um, there is a, a lot of evidence that Consumer warnings aren't that effective. Um, Harvard Business Review recently wrote that the answer was a resounding no for whether it was effective. Um, I found this particular warning to be confusing with six different instructions kind of packed in. And I go through a few other things in my written testimony. I, I want to mention that in our survey, um, uh, less than half of the parents with zero to two year olds said they always read the safety information. So I, less than half. So I think. Um, uh, relying on warnings as the principal means of keeping people safe um, is not uh, right. If something is fundamentally unsafe, it shouldn't be sold, particularly for young children. Back to the, the major principle. And in fact, um, we asked that question to parents. So I would just want to conclude by reading exactly what we uh, asked them. We said, if experts determine that crib bumpers have been linked to the death of some infants, um, do you think it would be a good idea or a bad idea for the government to stop them from being sold? I think that's the question we have. I don't think there's any question about whether they've been linked to the death of some infants. That is the CPSC's finding. That's everybody's finding. In answer to that question, of all adults, 63% said it would be a good idea, 10% a bad idea. The rest were unsure. Of parents of kids under two, 68% said it would be a good idea. 14% would be a bad idea. More than four times the number said good idea compared to bad idea. Dr. Sharfstein, please say, uh, conclude your remarks. That, that is the conclusion of my okay. remarks. I think they're right. Thank you very much. Dr. Moon? Good morning. Thank you for um, allowing us to be here. Um, my name is Rachel Moon. I'm the Harrison Distinguished Teaching Professor of Pediatrics and the Division Head of General Pediatrics at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. I've spent over 25 years studying infant mortality, safe and unsafe infant products, and sudden unexplained infant death. I previously done occasional work for the CPSC as a paid outside consultant on consumer products designed for infant use since uh, 2012. And I very much appreciate your invitation to speak to you today regarding the safety of crib bumpers. I'm speaking here today on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics, or AAP. I'm the chair of the AAP Task Force on Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. 
The CDC estimates that every year in the U.S. there are approximately 3,600 U.S. cases of sudden unexpected infant death or SUID. This includes sudden infant death syndrome, accidental suffocation or strangulation in a sleeping environment, and other deaths from unknown causes. Infants are uniquely vulnerable in their early stages of development when immature cardiorespiratory or arousal systems can lead to a failure of the protective responses that older children exhibit. Because of these de developmental differences, a sleep environment that is perfectly safe for an older child can pose potentially fatal risk to infants. Safe sleep guidelines, as outlined by the AAP, require placing babies on their back on a separate surface on a flat, firm surface with no loose fabric or soft bedding nearby. While much progress was made on SUID early in the efforts of the AAP and governmental partners like the CPSC in promoting safe sleep practices, we've seen this progress in reducing SUID plateau for the past decade, and actually the past two decades. In some high-risk groups, the, the rates are actually going in the wrong direction. The CPSC is in a unique position to help address the public health problem of SUID through its jurisdiction over infant products. The AAP has called on CPSC to reduce the hazard posed by certain infant sleep products and to use its position to promote improved understanding of how best to promote safe sleep among high-risk infants. The AAP warns against the use of many different kinds of soft bedding, largely because of the risk of accidental suffocation, entrapment, and strangulation. While the peak um, age range for sewage is between one and four months, newer evidence shows that soft bedding continues to pose hazards to infants who are four months and older and is indeed the predominant uh, sleep-related death risk factor for this age group. CPSC data show that pillows are associated with many accidental suffocation incidents when placed under or close to an infant. Quilts, comforters, sheepskins, and other soft bedding have also been associated with an increased risk of sudden infant death. Therefore, the AAP recommends that infants should be placed on a firm sleep surface covered by a fitted sheet with no other bedding or soft objects to reduce the risk of SIDS and suffocation. As the AAP and the CPSC have said many, many times, bear is best. This is why this forum on crib bumpers is so important. Bumper pads have been implicated in injuries and deaths attributable to suffocation, entrapment, and strangulation. And with new safety standards for crib, stats, crib slats, which the CPSC um, established several years ago, um, crib bumpers are no longer necessary for safety against head entrapment. So in 2016, the AAP Task Force on Sudden Infant Death Syndrome released its most recent recommendations for a safe sleep um, environment for infants, and these updated recommendations reiterate unequivocally that bumper pads have no place in a safe sleep environment. Their continued presence in the marketplace jeopardizes the clarity of AAP and CPSC messaging on safe sleep and puts infants at unnecessary risk. In the past, we've strongly disagreed with CPSC staff findings that the risks of bumpers do not outweigh the benefits. We believe the benefits to be non-existent, particularly if the bumpers are used as the manufacturers intend, and we believe that the risks are substantial. Dr. N.J. Shears and Dr. Bradley Thatch, um, who will uh, testify later today, um, they conducted a case series using 1985 to 2005 CPSC data and found that deaths attributed to bumper pads occurred as a result of three mechanisms. Suffocation against a soft pillow-like bumper pads due to obstructed airway or rebreathing of expired air. Entrapment between the mattress or the crib and firm, and, um, firm bumper pads. And strangulation from the bumper pad ties. However, a 2010 CPSC white paper that reviewed the same cases concluded that there, there were other confounding factors, such as the presence of pillows and or blankets that may have contributed to many of the deaths in this report. The white paper pointed out that available data from the scene investigations, autopsies, law enforcement records, and death certificates often lack sufficiently detailed information to conclude how or whether bumper pads contributed to deaths. Three more recent analyses of CPSC have also come to different conclusions. The two most recent CPSC reviews concluded again that there was insufficient evidence to support that bumper pads were primarily responsible for infant deaths when bumper pads were used per manufacturer instructions and in the absence of other unsafe sleep risk factors. However, Dr. Shears and Dr. Thatch, in their reanalysis of CPSC databases, which was published in 2016, found that the rate of bumper pad-related deaths had actually increased. 
Although they recognize that changes in reporting may account for at least part of this increase, they also concluded that 100% of these deaths could have been prevented if the bumper pads had not been present. We thus have significant concerns with CPSC determinations about the risks of bumpers in the face of this growing evidence. Other products such as mesh crib, uh, crib liners and crib slat covers attached to crib sides or crib slats and claim to protect infants from injury. However, there's no published evidence that support these claims and the risk of suffocation may outweigh any minimal safety benefit. We pediatricians are fond of saying that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So without published peer-reviewed data demonstrating that other products that attach to crib sides or crib slats such as mesh mesh crib liners and crib slat uh, covers do not, potent, uh, do not pose a potential for suffocation, entrapment, or strangulation. These products cannot claim to be safer alternatives to crib bumpers, and the AAP does not recommend their use. So we urge CPSC to look to peer-reviewed data in making these and other safe sleep assessments. The CPS, uh, CPSC's own website states that the CPSC is charged with protecting the public from unreasonable risks of injury or death associated with the use of the thousands of types of consumer products under the agency's jurisdiction. CPSC is committed to protecting consumers and families from products that, prevent, pr that pose a fire, electrical, chemical, or mechanical hazard." Unquote. A ban on crib bumpers unequivocally, unequivocally meets the standard and mission. Crib bumpers are associated with deaths, and they, pos they pose a mechanical hazard to infants. In addition, they are not an essential product, so their dubious benefit is far outweighed by the clear and present risk. Rather than, um, but rather than recommending a ban on bumpers, the CPSC staff briefing packages repeatedly seem to take the stance that unless death occurs in associ association with a crib bumper in the absence of any other risk factor, they will not recommend action on crib bumpers. This is not the agency's mission, this is not how pediatricians look at safe sleep, and this is inconsistent with best practices in public health. On the contrary, when determining the safety of a sleep environment, we look at the totality of the circumstances. We ask if anyone if the parent smokes, we ask if anybody is, is the baby is breastfeeding or formula feeding, and we ask if the family is bed sharing. We understand that elimination of each risk factor can contribute incrementally to sleep safety. The presence of crib, crib bumpers is one of these risk factors. We also understand that the CPSC has to look at the overall impact of any action. For instance, it is impractical to ban all soft beddings as other population groups besides infants use soft bedding. However, crib bumpers are supposed to be used only by infants younger than six months of age. Therefore, we believe that a ban would have little or no negative impact on the rest of the population, but would have a tremendous positive impact on infant sleep safety. If crib bumpers, if they are used by, um, as they're being used by consumers, whether in cribs with infants with colds or with other soft bedding or sleep positioners are involved in one infant death after another, the way to protect the public is to disallow their youth, use not to contort reasoning to permit the use of crib bumpers. The staff package states clearly that, quote, soft bedding is a suffocation hazard, unquote, despite its ostensible uh, purpose of keeping an infant warm. However, the staff package does not support a ban on crib bumpers, even though they pose the same hazards as soft bedding, because CPSC staff say that bumpers ostensibly serve the purpose of protecting infants from limb entrapment. This is logically inconsistent, confusing to consumers, and deadly for infants. A ban on crib bumpers would reinforce a message that bear is best. No soft bedding of any kind should be placed inside an infant's crib. There is one surefire way to prevent infant deaths from crib bumpers. Don't use them, ever. The AAP therefore reiter reiterates its request to the commission to ban crib bumpers without delay. Thank you again for the chance to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Incredible! You made it with one second to spare, uh, and I did want to point. Isn't it? <laughs> yes, I did want to point out that we have lights that go on the yellow and the red. I don't think Dr. Sharfstein could see it because maybe the computer was blocking it. But uh, we do move to the uh, the light system. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, your testimony, please. 
Thank you so much, Acting Chairman Adler and Commissioners Feldman, Biaco, and Kay in absentia. We hope you get well soon. Uh, my name is Ben Hoffman. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. And I'm here on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics, where I currently serve as chair of the Council on Injury, Violence, and Poison Prevention Executive Committee. We deeply appreciate the opportunity to participate in this important forum on crib bumpers. I recognize freely that the plural of anecdote is not the truth, but I want to start with a story. Um, two days ago on Monday, um, down the street from my home is a Pottery Barn Kids. I uh, have not been in there previously because my kids are all old, um, but I took the liberty uh, of a nice day in Portland with no rain to walk down the street. I went in and um, uh, talked with one of the salespeople uh, with the um, understanding that one of the staff in my office is pregnant and we were thinking as a group of of a, as a group of getting together and purchasing crib, a crib for them. Um, and I was shown a number of different cribs, each equipped with a big fluffy blanket and crib bumpers. And when I asked about the bumpers, we're told that they're necessary to prevent injury, that there are government standards around them, that they've been proven to be safe, and they could not be sold if we knew that they weren't safe. This is what I was told. An increasing number of unregulated sleep products that provide no added safety benefit to infants and in fact pose a real risk for suffocation can be found on the market. These include soft objects like pillows, pillow-like toys, quilts, comforters, sheepskins, sleep positioning products, and loose bedding including blankets and non-fitted sheets that can obstruct an infant's nose and mouth, posing a risk of suffocation, entrapment, or SIDS. As a pediatrician who specializes in injury prevention and safe sleep, I'm concerned by the proliferation of these products that are not only unnecessary for safe infant sleep, but in fact dangerous. As Dr. Moon said, the AAP has long recommended against the use of crib bumpers, which have no place in a safe sleep environment. The data clearly show that bumper pads and similar products attached to crib slats or sides are frequently used without the thought of protecting infants from injury. Or, sorry, with the thought of protecting infants from injury. And indeed, bumper pads were initially um, developed to prevent head entrapment between crib slats. However, based largely upon your work and the 2011 standards that required crib slats um, spacing to be less than 2 and 3 eighths inches, head entrapment is no longer a risk, and padded crib bumpers are now completely unnecessary. These products provide no benefit, pose a real and present danger in many of the nation's, inf the nation's infant sleep environments, and should be eliminated. Researchers have concluded that at best, the use of bumper pads may only prevent minor injuries. There is little to no data on the extent of those limb and head injuries, but knowing what we know about child development and physiology as a pediatrician, I'm certain they would be only very minor. Any potential benefit in pretending, uh, preventing minor injury with a bumper pad are far outweighed by the risk of serious injury or death. Again, this, this can occur due to entrapment between the mattress and crib bumpers, strangulation from loose ties, or other parts of the product, suffocation when an infant's head is pressed against the product, compressing the nose and mouth and obstructing the airway, and asphyxia when an infant's position on or near the product leads to rebreathing expired air. Qualitative research with mothers of infants have found that the primary reason that parents purchase crib bumpers is that they exist. They're cute, parents and parents often mistakenly believe that crib bumpers will prevent serious injury, mostly regarding fears about head trauma and limb entrapment. Regarding the risk of head trauma, I'd like to spend a minute thinking about physics, and I apologize for this in advance. We know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. And the force needed to incur major head trauma, such as a concussion, requires a large mass, large acceleration, or both. The 50th percentile for weight for a six-month-old infant is 6.5 kilograms, or approximately 14 pounds. I'm using that example because um, a six, month old, uh, is the, six months is the point at which uh, crib bumper manufacturers would recommend not using a bumper, but a six month old is going to be the, 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 um, the oldest and largest mass uh, infant who likely would be using it. An estimate to, of, of the force required to sustain a, a concussion is approximately 95 Gs, which translates to 931 Newtons, which is the universal unit of force. For a 6.5 kilogram infant to sustain um, 931 newtons of force to their head would require they hit the crib bumper at a speed of just over 29 miles per hour. I, I argue that it is impossible for an infant not being shot out of a cannon or something along those lines to sustain that force within a crib. I think we'd all agree it's out of the realm of possibility 
Um, the second concern that parents often have uh, is limb entrapment, and this was something that, that was discussed uh, by the salesperson with me. The majority of entrapments that occur are reported after the age of six months, which is past the age um, at which crib bumpers should be used. Developmentally, we know as pediatricians, most infants begin to roll over sometime between four to six months of age and pull to stand by nine to 12 months of age. These motor skills are prerequisites for limb entrapment, and therefore, if the product is being used according to manufacturer's instructions, it shouldn't even be in the crib when entrapment is a risk. Even if we can consider their use after the age of six months, I think we'd all agree, although entrapment at this point may cause some momentary distress, and I as a pediatrician recognize the impact that an infant waking can have on both the infant and the family, I would take an entrapped limb with, no, with minimal to no injury and some inconvenience over SIDS or other catastrophic um, event any day. Crib bumpers are wholly unnecessary for a safe crib, and the real and substantial risks of death outweigh any minor, minor to negligible safety benefit. We support banning crib bumpers federally, as several state and local jurisdictions have already successfully done. Education and intervention campaigns are often effective in altering practice, and pediatricians continue to engage in these campaigns. Since the 90s, concerted education efforts uh, by the CPSC, AAP, and other partners have led to tremendous progress in decreasing infant sleep-related fatality. The CPSC Safe Sleep Awareness Campaign has been a very useful tool for pediatricians seeking to help parents understand what constitutes a safe sleep environment for babies. And we're very glad that this information exists in both Spanish and English. The commission should definitely continue its work in promoting safe sleep behaviors and removing unsafe sleep products from the marketplace, including working with other federal agencies and stakeholder groups, including the AAP. However, our warnings about crib bumpers are frustrated when the CPSC's own messaging on bumpers is muddled at best. Most parents are aware now that babies should sleep on their back, but fewer than 50% are aware that babies should not sleep with soft bedding. We believe this is largely because of the confusing messages that parents receive by seeing bumpers available for sale, as I saw. They see advertisement after advertisement for cozy bedding, including crib bumpers, and they believe that they are not good parents unless they provide a soft, comfortable sleep environment for their infant. Unfortunately, these good intentions often end up being deadly. We believe that when crib bumpers are available for sale, it confuses the safe sleep message for parents. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard from a parent the belief that if they sell them, they must be safe. A surprising number of parents believe there's an agency out there that tests all infant products before they're sold to make sure that they're safe. In other words, an FDA for infant products. As you know, that agency does not exist. We understand the CPSC is not a proactive agency um, that tests products before they're sold, but a reactive agency that alerts consumers to problems with products that are already on the market. However, we're not talking about a theoretic risk. We're asking you to prospectively address, but one with data demonstrating its fatality risk and making plain the importance of decisive CPSC action. In just the past year, we've seen the consequences of products that are marketed and purported to be safe for infant sleep, but run contrary to safe sleep guidelines. Popular infant inclined sleep products like the Rock and Play Sleeper were recalled, but only after over 70 infants' deaths had been, um, were identified associated with the products. Tragedies like that are preventable, and you play a crucial role to provide regulatory oversight to protect infants from sleep-related products that are not safe for sleep and pose a fatality risk. We have a letter that has currently been signed by 41 organizations that we will be submitting, and it will be signed by many more before, it, um, before time is up, to the Consumer Product Safety Commission to remove all crib bumpers and liners from the market to protect infants and families. We'll submit this letter as, written, as a written record, uh, comment to the record. I thank you very much again for the opportunity to come and address you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Coles? Thank you. Thank you for holding this forum, for inviting us to testify. Um, I think that it's a very important topic, and we appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to get this uh, high level of expertise and experience in the room uh, together. I'm honored to be on this panel with these uh, experts on child safety. Their work has kept many children safe, and uh, I think hopefully if we can get these padded bumpers off the market, we would uh, move even farther ahead. The case against permitting crib bumpers in a child's sleep environment is clear. As has been said, this isn't medicine vital to a child's health that may have some side effects we need to, to weigh. It isn't a product that serves a safety purpose and only proper education on its use is needed. This is an unnecessary accessory to decorate a nursery that has no place in a safe sleep environment. 
By talking about the so-called safety benefits of bumper pads, both the manufacturers and the CPSC staff are saying a crib is not safe on its own. That's a very dangerous message. Bumpers don't make today's very safe cribs any safer. They just increase the likelihood of suffocation or entrapment. When Dr. Thatch published his research in 2007 in the journal Pediatrics, we thought that that would put an end to the sale of crib bumper pads. Dr. Thatch, who you'll hear from today with more recent research, found 27 deaths over a period of about a decade that were attributable to bumper pads, where babies were found with their face or head against the bumper pad or wedged between the mattress and the bumper pad. But unfortunately, the industry tried to discredit the research and bumpers remained on store shelves. In February 2010, Aiden suffocated against his crib bumper in Texas. His grandmother had purchased the bumper pads herself, led to believe they were important to keep her grandson from injuring him himself. Imagine her heartache after learning that the very thing she purchased thinking it would protect her beloved grandson ended up being what suffocated him as he slept. Then we met Preston's family. Just eight weeks old, Preston slept on a sleep positioner in the middle of his crib. His distraught parents found him one morning. He had rolled off the sleep positioner and ended up with his face between the bumper pad and the mattress. Immediately after Preston's death, the CPSC, along with the FDA, led by Dr. Sharfstein, issued a warning against sleep positioners, saying they were unnecessary and dangerous. For years, that reduced the number of sleep positioners on the market to almost zero. We're now beginning to see them crap, creep back in online and urge CPSC to stay vigilant on this issue as well. But no action was taken by CPSC to eliminate the bumper Preston suffocated against. As we've seen with both bumpers and inclined sleep products more recently, almost safe is not safe enough. Manufacturers say bumpers keep a baby's arms and legs from getting stuck between the slats. But our recent review of saferproducts.gov this month showed that on that database, where an age is reported, 95% of the reports of limb entrapment in cribs are of babies over the age of six months, when manufacturers themselves recommend the product be removed to prevent falls. So the message is, is that if parents don't heed their warnings, the product offers protection. We must stop the use of crib bumper pads for our vulnerable babies. A bump or bruise of the leg or even the head is nothing compared to the horror that Preston and Aiden's families and others like them face when they find a lifeless baby. The CPSC proposed rule is based on limited data, as others will show. Not only does CPSC not have all the cases seen in other research, they in many cases have ignored the medical examiner's finding and substituted staffs. This proposed rule is based solely on their own research with no consideration of additional research much presented here today that shows the danger bumper pads pose. The only completely new test in this proposed rule addresses only one scenario, the mechanical suffocation where a child's nose and mouth are completely closed off by an outside product. A standard based on this proposed rule would simply mean that the very type of bumpers we know have suffocated children would now be labeled by the CPSC as safe, creating even more confusion among consumers. CPSC's report, Table 1 in the report uh, with the proposed rule, shows 53% of infant deaths involving bumpers were caused by entrapment or wedging, a hazard that will not be addressed by the rigid bumper that the, uh, that the um, standard proposes. And it may increase the likelihood of entrapment between the bumper and crib side mattress or other object. An additional 8% are categorized as possible wedging or entrapment. The incidents that don't result in death are as important to look at as the deaths. We see additional near strangulations, entrapments, and babies found under or behind bumpers that could have led to serious injury or death. Interestingly, the largest number of reports in this category of non-fatalities is slat entrapment, the only safety reason given by manufacturers to have a bumper. It appears that perhaps the bumpers are not effective even in preventing limb entrapments. In addition, the firmness test is using a test that was developed for testing sleeping surfaces, not vertical padding around the infant. There is no evidence that this test would eliminate the hazard and might even cause additional hazards when the now rigid mattress-like bumper is upright and in place. And there is no evidence given by the agency to show that padded bumpers of this thickness have not been involved in incidents. 
It will encourage thick, more rigid bumpers, which again has not been shown to reduce the risk that bumpers pose. The proposed rule points to the state and local laws on crib bumpers that could be nullified if the standard is adopted. In addition to the two states and two municipalities listed, New York has recently adopted a ban on padded crib bumper pads. If this rule is adopted and preempts these local laws, more than 400,000 babies annually will lose the protection that they now have from this dangerous product, and no babies will be any safer since the rule still allows dangerous padded bumper pads. In addition, the risk of suffocation from crib bumper pads, there's also the issue of contributing to sudden unexpected infant death by reducing airflow in the crib and confusing parents on the safe sleep message. The messaging is simple and straightforward. Back to sleep, bear is best. Both messages have reduced infant deaths. But bear is best runs counter to our intuition of what we think babies need. Softness and padding are the opposite of how babies sleep safely which is why the sale of padded bumpers not only increases the risk of babies suffocating on the pad itself, but of following the lead of manufacturers by adding more padding around their baby. Those in the child safety and public health arenas work tirelessly to educate parents on this concept. Bumpers make it all the harder. As long as bumpers are still on store shelves and internet marketplace, they will continue to be used and babies will continue to die, despite every health and safety organization warning against their use. As has been repeatedly said, parents believe it would not be sold if someone had not made sure it was safe. And it's important to remember, as you see here today, that every health and safety organization that deals with infant safety opposed the sale and use of crib bumper pads. I urge you to move to protect our most vulnerable consumers from this unnecessary product and ban crib bumper pads. As I said, we thought in 2007 we had enough data to compel us to stop selling this product. I was wrong then, but I hope you take the action now, 13 years later. Uh, thank you all very much for your testimony. We'll now have a round of questions, and, and I will begin with my questions. So Dr. Sharfstein, uh, you made this point and others have echoed it, but I'd really like to nail it down if I could, and that is the assertion that there's no benefit associated with uh, crib bumpers, and we've heard of two at least, and one of which is comfort, and the other of which is the prevention of limb entrapment. So may I ask that you elaborate on your point that this presents uh, gives us no benefit, and others uh, after Dr. Sharfstein answers, if you want to uh, weigh in, please do. Sure. I mean, well, when I say no benefit, I mean no meaningful benefit. Nothing that should be uh, relevant to counter the risks that are there. Um, but really, I don't see, you know, what, even if you were to look at, like, what is benefit? Look, the, the evidence that we have of harm are not just medical examiners, but even if you take the CPSC's conclusion that kids have died from crib bumpers, you know, in, in I think 83 of the cases, it's not incidental. That is meaningful evidence of harm. So where is the evidence of a benefit that can, where, where's the, the rate of limb entrapment? Where's the consequences of limb entrapment? I was looking for that section in the proposed rule. Like, that's how I would think about it, you know? I mean, are we talking about 100,000 limb entrapments versus one that, like, how do you even begin to do that? There's nothing, no organized analysis on the other side. There's sort of like, uh, you know, the, the theory and then what evidence is there, as the people here on the, on the panel have said, is really related to older kids. And I think Nancy Cowles made a good point that it's there with the crib bumpers too. There, there are kids who are entrapped. In fact, it might be easier for all we know to get entrapped with that because once you get your arm through, you can't get it out because you've got the bumper preventing you from doing it. You know, So I don't know if that's true. <laughs> I don't know very much of anything, but like after all these years, there's no compelling description of benefit that can counteract what is in fact a very compelling con you know, description of harm that the CPSC accepts. So I would invite comments from any of the other uh, t uh, testifiers, uh, in particular the existence or lack of existence of any uh, data sources or any peer-reviewed studies. So I, I th Dr. Moon, I think you mentioned that in your testimony. Uh, there has been one study, I believe, that um, by Ye um, et al. that um, looked at the risks um, or the benefits of, um, of crib bumpers and, and found that um, it didn't really, they, they did not um, reduce the risk of limb entrapment. And limb entrapment 
as, as Dr. Hoffman said, is a nuisance, but it doesn't generally cause injury. Um, and I think that the reason why there haven't been many studies on this is because there really is not much injury that occurs as a result of this. So, you know, for a child to have a fracture or something like that due to limb entrapment, it generally doesn't happen unless the child is old enough um, that they shouldn't be using bumper pads anyway. And yet concluded that, um, that the benefits did not um, outweigh the risks of using bumper pads, and so they concluded that bumper pads should be banned as well. I, I appreciate that comment. Uh, one of the other things that I found intriguing and troubling as I was reviewing the staff briefing package and, and as I've looked at your testimony is what I would call the confound of soft bedding because a fair number of these incidents seem to involve both soft bedding uh, and crib bumpers, and trying to sort out what the risk is is a difficult challenge, and I'm curious if any of you have any insight, uh, looking at the data that we have and looking at the data that you've cited, about how we tease that out and what meaningful uh, causal nexus is there between the uh, crib bumper and the fatality of a child. Uh, and Dr. Hoffman, if you want to start. So I, I'm not aware of any data that specifically looks at that, but I think we need to look at this from a harm reduction standpoint. Um, and that, you know, go back to what everybody in the panel has said, we know what a safe sleep environment looks like. It's difficult, you know, because products are there and there is pervasive attitude about what, you know, how, how parents want their babies to sleep. Um, the fact that, that um, things that, that there is an opportunity for them to utilize something like a crib bumper. If, you know, as, as, as I said in my experience with the, with the salesperson, it's there. Um, we don't know, I, I can't tell you 100% that in circumstances where there's soft bedding, in the case that, that uh, Ms. Cowles talked about with an infant who was on a position or who rolled over, I am relatively certain, although I don't have data to back this up, that if the crib bumper wasn't there and the baby had rolled off, they, they much less likely they were much less likely to suffocate. I think we need to think about this from a harm reduction standpoint. And it, it you know, soft bedding is, that's, that's a fight we're gonna have to continue to fight. We can't ban blankets across the board. But a product that's specifically manufactured and marketed for infants that we know to be dangerous is not something we should have. Uh, Dr. Sharfstein? Yeah, I, I was gonna say like, there are deaths where the child is found pressed, suffocated against the crib bumper. I mean, there's no question in the mind of a very experienced medical examiner like we had in Maryland that it was the cause of the death. I find a lot of this kind of picking through, and this happened in Maryland too, like how many of these deaths really, you know, how many does it take? You know, the CPSC found 83 non-incidental deaths. Now, maybe the number is 500, maybe it's 400, maybe it's 100. It doesn't matter to me, and I don't think it should matter to you as you're thinking of the, whether a risk is unreasonable. It's unreasonable to have a risk of death for a product that has no meaningful benefit. Uh, Ms. Coles, one of the things that you mentioned and others did as well is the notion of the CPSC not taking stronger action against crib bumpers, somehow sending a message that uh, they're legal, they're safe. Um, and I don't think we ever take the position of endorsing the safety of a product, but by virtue of not banning it, we are in effect saying it does not present an unreasonable risk of injury. And that is a proposition that's an implicit endorsement of uh, crib bumpers. And I was wondering if you have any further elaboration of the point that you were making in that regard. And again, I invite anybody to join in as well on that point. Yeah, I, th I think that as we've all talked about, and uh, all of us here work daily to try and get kids in safe sleep environments. We talk about the soft bedding. It is complicated when manufacturers are selling soft bedding. Again, by the fact that it's still in stores because you haven't eliminated it as a product, it's going to be assumed safe. We can all say anything. Even CPSC says bear is best occasionally, right? And so, um, but that doesn't resonate if they go to the store and find it because if you really thought it was unsafe, it would no longer be in that store is what parents think. Um, and I think the important thing is it's a hard message to get across, a bear is best, right? It's the opposite of our intuition when it comes to babies. And that's why we work so hard on the messaging and selling soft bedding, because you differentiate between soft bedding and bumpers. They're all one and the same. A bumper is soft bedding. It's 
something soft you put into a, a child's crib. Um, and so as long as you're selling one thing that you say is safe, um, then you're confusing those parents because what's different from them putting a rolled up towel? You may see the difference, but they wouldn't see the difference because you're already selling them something that seems similar to them. So it's a hard message. Bumpers make it harder. Uh, one of the things that uh, you all mentioned is that at some point, and presumably six months, is when a child can step on the crib bumper and use that to get out of the crib, and that presents a risk in and of itself. And as I understand it, uh, manufacturers warn against that, and our uh, proposed standard has this warning that Dr. Sharfstein mentioned. And I did want to mention a concern I had, because it isn't until you get the very bottom of that, and not in bolded, it says, Remove this product when baby can pull to a stand using crib side parents starting about six months. Older babies can use the product to climb out of the crib. And I'm curious if you have a reaction, first of all, to the specifics of this warning, but secondly, to the aspect of warnings in general. How likely is it if a parent seen that warning for six months that they would stop noticing it or would uh, not react to it? Dr. Moon, if you had a comment. Um, so first of all, um, in the fewer than half of the parents who would read the crib warning, they would most likely read it when they first bought the crib. Um, having been a parent, um, I often didn't remember the next day what I had read the day before, um, as opposed to six months down the line where you say, oh yes, today is Johnny's six month birthday. It is time to take the, the crib bumper out of the crib um, because that's what I read six months ago. So I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, so. I, I don't, so number one, I don't think that the crib warning, the crib uh, bumper warning is, is effective, um, nor do I think that it helps to protect the children. Um, and I'd also like to, to mention um, a little bit about um, selling products. Please and, do it in yes, 15 seconds if you can. In six, 15 seconds. We have to also deal with what the social norm is. And if, if everybody believes that you have to be a good parent uh, in order to be a good parent, you should buy these things because if you don't, then other people are going to judge you. Then, um, which is what this this um, person at the store was trying to do to Dr. Hoffman. Then, um, then you're going to buy the product. So we need to we need to send a message that this is not normative behavior. Thank you all very much. I now turn for questions from Commissioner Kay. I hope you're still there, and please feel free to ask questions at this point. I am, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to assure you in your itchy gavel hand that I am running a 10-minute timer here. Thank you. So I want to, I want to uh, start with Dr. Sharfstein, and I actually first say to all of you how much we appreciate your expertise and also taking the time to come in because obviously there are costs in terms of people that you're not seeing, patients you're not seeing for some of you, or advocacy that you're not doing in other areas. And so it means a lot for us that you would come in, and I would say that to all of the panelists that we see as well later today. I'm sure that when you saw that the hearing was put on, part of the reaction for all of you was, you got to be kidding me. What is taking this agency so long? And isn't it so obvious to everybody that a conclusive case has been made that these products need to be addressed. And I can't speak for my fellow commissioners, but I can say that at least in the time that I've been at the commission, I've been convinced for a long time that the case has been made. And so I think it's important to try to focus a little bit in it on why has the agency not done more? And I would uh, assign most of that blame really to the statutory structures that we operate under. And, and Dr. Sharfstein, I completely hear you when you talk about the framework that you used in Maryland and that you would continue to use in how you would assess the hazards. Unfortunately, we have a more rigorous, not rigorous in terms of from a public health standpoint, but really legally a more rigorous legal standard that we have to follow. And our two choices are either, either to follow Section 7, 8, and 9 of the Consumer Product Safety Act and to seek a ban or if we believe it's a durable infant product, which I do, and the commission, I believe, has already said it does, to try to come up with an effective regulation under Section 104. If the goal of the stakeholder community is to have regulatory action done by the agency, I do think it's important that folks 
focus in on the legal requirements that exist in those statutes, particularly if you seek a ban, Section 7, 8, and 9 of the CPSA, and use the remainder, remaining comment period time to provide the kind of data that you believe exists out there that would support the various factors in that statute. In the absence of having that data, and even sometimes with that data, it's still a challenge for us, but certainly in the absence of it, we have no chance of moving forward in a regulatory fashion. And we can completely agree with everything you're saying. I personally do agree with everything you're saying. But that agreement alone does not help us in terms of, of satisfying those statutory elements. It just comes down to whether or not we can make the case. And so, again, I urge both the panelists here, any panelists and any stakeholders on any side of the issue to look at the statutes and look at what is required. And if you feel a case should be made, to go ahead and to provide more data along those lines. So having said that, I do want to turn to some specific issues. And first, Dr. Sharfstein, I do want to assure you that I would not support any efforts by the agency that would preempt stronger actions taken by other jurisdictions. I do not think that that's the way it should work. I don't think that consumers are well served by that. And again, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I want to make that assurance to you. Beyond that, though, part of the frustration is that we are dealing with a discrete product category in a larger area of unsafe sleep. And I hope that all of the panelists would be able to continue to help us if we are able to address bumpers, how we move past to uh, address the remaining issues of safe sleep. And so without getting into too much detail, I'll start with, uh, with Dr. Sharfstein, but I'd like to hear from all the panelists. Do you feel like if the agency is able to deal with bumpers, you have other specific suggestions that would help us tackle infant safe, safe sleep issues on a larger level? You know, I think I'm going to defer to my colleagues here who work more intensely on safe sleep. I'm here as sort of like a little bit of based on my major focus on bumpers, and I would look to the experts in the AP. I, th I would just say two quick things. One is, to your point, I don't know of any other issue where you have the entire scientific and public health uh, community aligned on what the evidence suggests a public agency could do. If I were back at FDA, I would be so happy for an issue where everyone who, whose interest was in the health of children, that was their job, actually agreed with what should be done. That is so rare. It is extraordinary that in the face of that, the agency hasn't yet moved forward. To your second, just if you permit me, very quick point, and I very much respect your, your position, and I'm, as I said, I'm not a lawyer. I think the view that, that we have and that the Attorney General of Maryland has is that there is adequate authority to, to ban, but if in the end you decide there isn't, it, in my view, is the responsibility of the commission to state that you believe the product should be banned and you don't have the authority and to ask Congress for legislation to do that. I think that is the responsible regulator's position if you think that something is the right thing to do. And so um, that, I would not just stop by, you know, by, by saying that in a hearing. I would recommend that the commission flatly say that this, these products are unsafe, they should be banned, we don't think the legal standard is met, help us with a different legal standard. I think that's the responsibility. I, I'm not saying you need to conclude that, but if you do conclude that, that's more important than setting a standard that actually won't protect kids. And, and if I, before Dr. Moon jumps in, if I can just respond to that, and I do appreciate that suggestion, and I recognize it might be splitting hairs, but we sort of did do that in 2016 when four of the five then sitting commissioners came together and said, we, based on the data in front of us, we do not, and while we continue to work on regulating these or, or otherwise, we do not believe that they should be sold and we do not believe that they should be used. I recognize that's not speaking directly to Congress, but certainly Congress can infer from that statement that based on what we knew at the time, we had reached that position. Do you feel that that, that was not a direct enough statement to Congress? Trying to think what I was doing in 2016. Um, I, I, it did not penetrate my world, believe it or not. I was not aware. I th I'm glad that you did that. I think that um, I would recommend doing it again and more clearly if that, if that in fact, is your conclusion. Great. Thank you, Dr. Moon. 
Um, I would agree with everything that Dr. Sharfstein has said. Um, with regards to your question about are there other soft bedding products or products that I would recommend banning um, if we uh, f once if we finish with bumper bumpers, um, and I'm not clear that we will, but, um, that that's hard to say because um, one could spend one's whole life chasing products on the internet. Um, every week, I get. Um, a, an email or a phone call from somebody who is concerned about a product that a parent is using, and I look at it and I was like, wow, I didn't know that, that existed. Um, and it's hard for me to, to be able to say, and maybe Dr. Hoffman ha or, or um, Nancy Coles has, um, has more insight into this to, to say there are specific categories of products that we would go after next. Um, and I, uh, for me, I don't know that that's the case, but I do know that it's, um, it's wild, wild west out there. And it just seems like every day um, there's another product on the market that I look at and I think, oh my goodness, there are so many hazards here. Yes, we feel the exact same way. Uh, Dr. Hoffman? Um, I'm going to go ahead, uh, Commissioner Kay, if that's okay. It's Nancy, obviously. Sure, sure, of course. Um, <laughs> given the, the limited time here. Um, I think the CPSC has already started work on the next most important thing with safe sleep, and that's the infant sleep product standard that would eliminate these daily entries into the market of products that consumers assume you have to already decide they're safe, but have no standard that covers them. There should not be a product available for sale for an infant sleep environment that doesn't meet a federal standard. Um, it's the one place we leave children alone, babies alone. It's the one place where it has to be completely safe because not only do you put your baby in there to sleep, but it's the only place a very exhausted caregiver has to put the baby down and know that they might not be happy, but they will be safe. Um, and the fact that we allow these, we saw what happened with the inclined sleep products, there's more products like that. So I think that's the next important thing for this agency to do. Great, thank you. And in 15 seconds, Dr. Hoffman. So thank you, Commissioner Kay. I really don't have anything to add on top of that other than, than echoing what Ms. Callis just said about um, addressing standards. I think, you know, I, as a pediatrician, I acknowledge that for many families or most families, sleep for infants is among the most complicated, difficult things they're ever going to do. And the promise of hope, um, I think, is what pulls people forward. And selling hope uh, in a way that's dangerous to babies is something we just can't accept. Thank you. Great. Uh, Thank you so much. Commissioner Bianco. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I found all of the information extremely interesting. I did read everything with one exception, which I'll get to. And I do understand it all, including the physics, Dr. Hoffman. Um, Dr. Um, Sharfstein, I, I think the most compelling thing I've heard so far today is what you said about the weighing the bis uh, risks and the benefits. I think that that is a, a very compelling point. What I do not agree with you on, and I don't think you're right on, is the legal analysis for all the reasons that Commissioner Kay said and more. We do have um, uh, an absence right now of data to um, fall into the, the two categories. So on that note, do you have, it's been a while since Maryland banned the um, crib bumpers. Do you have any data that demonstrates that the reduction in infant fatalities in Maryland is directly related to the ban? That would be helpful if you do. It's too complicated to be able to say it's directly related to the ban, but we do see reductions in sleep-related deaths, considerably steep reductions in sleep-related deaths. And so that um, we think is both direct and indirect, you know, both because of you know, the potential that maybe there would have been actual kids smushed up against the bumpers, but also because um, particularly Baltimore City where we've gone from 25 to 30 uh, sleep-related deaths a year down to uh, seven to 12, depending on the year. Um, there's such a strong, clear, safe sleep messaging that is very clear, no bumpers, no anything. And so I think it's helped with that messaging. So it's, I mean, I think our view is it has been helpful, but um, it's not possible to assign a specific causality. Um, thank you. Um, 
Well, I'm going to jump around here. I'm sorry um, if I'm jumping around. Um, Dr. Hoffman, when you went into the um, retailer and asked about that, um, I, I, I'm not sure I followed everything you said. So you went in and your, your assistant's not really pregnant, right? You, you just, no. okay. Is that your only experience with a salesperson? Oh, goodness, uh, no. Okay. So do no. you have, I'd be interested in um, whether there's a study as to, you know, is, is there anything consistent that we're hearing out in the market or uh, do you know of any study like that? I'm not aware of any studies like that. Um, my children will tell you anecdotally that I have been doing that for years um, and it has been a very consistent experience. I do that okay. with, with car safety seats as well. Um, at retailers just because I'm very passionate about this and I'm interested in what my, what my families are hearing. Um, and a lot of that is driven by my experience as a clinician when, when parents and caregivers tell me of an experience that they had. Um, and I have had, exper I have had um, um, direct experience in uh, coworkers um, in putting together um, lists for baby showers. Um, asking about things. Actually, one of my coworkers um, currently who has a two-year-old, um, when I emailed uh, my staff to say I was coming here, said, thank God you're going. I still, I have so many friends who are still using those and they won't listen to me. Okay. Um, so I, I don't have any hard data. I think that would be a great thing for us to do. Because what, 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 something you said I hadn't thought of before, and that was your point about blankets. Mm -hmm. If they're misused, mm -hmm. or we do have uh, data of children dying because you know they suffocate in a in a blanket or too much stuff in a crib, whether it's a crib bumper or uh, blank uh, extra blankets, pillows, and uh, Ms. Coles, I think you also mentioned the rolled up towel. We used to have the positioners, and mm -hmm. when my kid was born, there were positioners and and so forth. Um, are you? Cons I mean, you're not saying to to a ban to ban those products as well. As well, I think what I'm hearing you say is we need to get that bare as best messaging out there, and no matter what you tell parents, uh, they are going to do what they think is best. Correct. Yes, but I think that there are issues. There's a, there's a difference to me between a blanket, which I would not recommend for a, you know, a younger child, um, and blankets are going to be sold outside of specific you know, mm -hmm. baby, uh, uh, baby distributors and baby stores. But there's something about bumpers specifically manufactured and marketed for, for a purpose for an age group. Um, and again, as was repeated by multiple members of this panel, have no demonstrable benefit and clear associated risk. And I think we need to take the harm reduction approach and say if that's one thing we can do, we should start with that. Which, which I hear and I do get. What, I, what I'm concerned about is we, we do have a, a structure, a rigorous legal structure we are working involved, within. And as Dr. Moon pointed out, and I think is also a good point, when you're buying stuff online or you get online, you're going to get stuff coming in. And if, there's, if the products don't have a standard, or some standard that we can come to the middle and agree, we're going to have an even bigger problem because there's everything you could possibly imagine out there, mm -hmm. especially um, from uh, organizations outside and th who aren't following the standard. Go ahead. Could I respond? Sure. To that? So there's a, a past history of when um, the FDA was investigating taking infant cold medicines off the market. And we had a hearing at FDA. I was a health commissioner in Baltimore. We had led a petition to take them off the market. Similar argument, no evidence of benefit, deaths of infants. And the major argument I would characterize as like, let's protect the parents from hurting the babies. That was the response by the companies that made that. They said, if they don't have these generally ineffective but rarely harmful medicines to give, they'll do all kinds of things. And people were testifying, they'll give the adult dose to kids. They'll, I mean, and they do. All Still. those things are possible, right? There's data about what happened after that came off the market. There are multiple published studies, dramatic reductions in overdoses, right. dramatic reductions in injuries. In the case of the over the counter cough and cold medicine, I don't think it's true. I don't think the parents want to hurt their babies. I, I, I think the parents listen to clear don't. messages that come from their doctors, from uh, public health agencies, and ultimately from the CPSC. Don't use it because it's unsafe. People, listen to that. And I think that the answer, we were warned we were going to make things worse for kids. 
study after study showed dramatic declines in harms to kids when we did that. And I think the same exact logic with the same exact parents and the same exact age group would apply here. And the same exact data, if you have, would be very helpful if there's a direct correlation to the Maryland ban and the reduction in child um, sleep deaths. It's, it's very important, and I can't stress this enough, that the legal structure that we're working in, as Commissioner Kay uh, pointed out, is is binding. Uh, so, it, but can, can the legal structure really require that a state? Uh, yes, do it a does. Yes, it does. Okay. Um, so, Ms. Coles, here's my one exception that I didn't read. I did not get a chance to read what you submitted either last night or this morning. I didn't get it till this morning. What's different between what I had yesterday and what you submitted today? So today I added, and you probably heard a little bit more on the rule itself. Okay. Um, the, but but the basic arguments and everything was. My main points were in what was submitted earlier. Okay, and, and I went back and looked. I didn't remember hearing this or seeing this when I read it, so I may have missed it, or it's in your new version. But you you, you said that the uh, there were instances where the our CPSC staff substituted its um, view for the medical examiner. You see something like that. So I think you'll hear that in later testimony today, that there are cases where on the death certificate it is said that the baby suffocated on the bumper and the staff in reviewing it decided that was not the cause. Okay, I would really like to see those, um, I, those incidents. If you don't yeah. hear that this afternoon in the testimony, yeah, I will get the information up. to you. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you very much. It was very interesting, very helpful. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Feldman? Thank you. Um, and I want to start by thanking all of you for being here today. Um, I wasn't here in 2016 when, when we last took this issue up in a meaningful way. Therefore, I'm, I'm new to the issue and uh, very much in, in listen and learning mode today. So hearing all of you talk about the research that you've done is incredibly helpful. Um, I think what makes this, this, this issue difficult, in addition to some of the issues that were, were raised today, is that you all have had an opportunity to take a look at, at, at the underlying data and come to a conclusion. Um, on the other hand, some really smart people, including uh, 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 researchers on our, own, on our own staff at the agency, have looked at the same data and come with different conclusions. Um, so we're in the process of, of sorting through all that. Uh, but Dr. Sharfstein, I, I wanted to start with you and, and drill down a little bit more about what the experience has been in, in, in Maryland. Um, it, it, it's useful to have a state that has, has gone and, and put through a product ban in, in, in place and, and being able to take a look at sort of what that experience has been should be instructive for, um, for, for us as, as, as we grapple with, with a, a very, very similar issue. Although as I think is, is being teased out in the conversation here, it sounds like there's different standards that may be at play. So when you were addressing this in Maryland, what is the Maryland standard for a, products, a product ban? Actually, the Maryland standard is based on the CPSC standard. Okay. And I, I, I'll get you the exact wording. We have a state um, law that I think, uh, just because I'm not 100% sure remembering this, I'll, I'll go back, um, is, is based on a CPSC law. And we use that law. And then we did a regulatory process pursuant to that law okay. to you know, get as much information as we can, convene external experts, do a whole, two public comment periods, sure. everything we could to figure out whether these were unreasonable risks. Okay. Because our standard to ban a product under Section 8 of our statute is more than just whether or not the product represents an unreasonable risk. Um, there's a whole second part of the analysis that takes a look at whether there's any feasible product safety standard that would have uh, an adequate reduction in, in, in what that risk is. And listening to the discussion here today, diving very deep into this question of um, whether a benefit exists, and I'm, I'm hearing some shades of, of, of variation in, in how you all are answering that question. I'm hearing that there's no benefit to the, to the product, that there's uh, a, a minor to negligible benefit, that there's some attendant safety benefit with some of the breathable liners. Um, but, but taking that all aside, I, I think that, that um, risk to harm analysis really speaks to the first part of the question that we need to answer with respect to whether or not the product um, represents a, 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 an unreasonable product hazard. I mean, I don't read anything in the documents that there's a way to substantially lower this risk short of taking them off the market, anywhere, any of the, any of the research to suggest that. And, 
I don't actually think there's that much of a scientific dispute. And maybe this is where I'm a little bit... Uh, I know that people are going to be arguing that this death is it this way or that way. Right. But the CPSC staff believes these things contribute to the, the death of children. I mean, right. it is incontrovertible when you look at some of these deaths. There is a death risk. Against that, I think we're all in agreement. No meaningful benefit. You know, and so to, to, to us, you put those together, you have no evidence of doing anything that will actually reduce... And that risk of death to an acceptable level, which I don't know if there is an acceptable level of risk of death for a young child, um, then we believe that the legal standard can be met. And, you know, I, I realize that it is, and that, that everybody here is, is doing their best to understand what, what the legal framework is. I think um, I read this, as, you know, in pediatrics, sometimes we think, are we treating ourselves? Are we treating the child? Are we doing something to make ourselves feel better? Like putting a confusing warning label on is not helping the parents. You know, it's just not. It, it, it's treating ourselves in a way. We sort of feel like maybe there's some standard we're meeting. What would treat the child, what would help the child is unquestionable. And even in all the questions today, if everybody is in agreement that the, the harms outweigh, outweigh the benefits of these products, then, you know, and there's no way to, to eliminate them, that is an unreasonable risk of injury. Sure, but I, 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 don't, I don't want to belabor the point, but whether or not there's an unreasonable risk of injury is mm -hmm. just one part of the many questions that we need to get to in order to accomplish what you are all asking us to do today, which is to ban the product under Section 8 of our statute. Um, you know, it, the, the, the question of labeling you know, wh whether or not that label is, is confusing, mm -hmm. um, y you're actually in some ways arguing against what you're asking for because if there's a way to make those labels less confusing, then there's perhaps a feasible labeling standard that could be applied that, that makes it just more difficult to get to the, 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 the outcome that, that I hear you all asking us for. And uh, you know, please hear that, that, I, that I'm struggling with this. Uh, because y y you talked about acceptable uh, uh, number of deaths. There's no acceptable number of deaths. Any of these deaths is, is, is tragic. Um, but as Commissioner Kay said, uh, and, 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 and what, what I hope you're hearing, there's bipartisan concern on, 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 the, on, the, on the commission um, that we're not there yet with respect to meeting all of the requirements that, that, that we would need to get to to have a band that 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 is enforceable and 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 that won't fall when it's challenged, so I, I really do want to get this right. I, I totally appreciate that, and I um, my point about the labeling was not that I think there's a way to make it less confusing, but that I'm trying to understand a little bit of how the CPSC staff is thinking about this. Yes, and I just think it's completely in the wrong direction. I, I mean, yes. less than half of the parents say they read all the the labeling, and that's even at birth. And there's, I don't know whether um, labeling can reduce the risk unless people don't use the product at all. And, and, you know? and that's, that's a discussion, but I think that's part of the discussion that we need to have in order to get to yes on what I'm being asked here today to consider. I, I, um, and, and what I'm hearing from, from the panel today is an extensive conversation uh, and, and deep dive into whether or not the products are un un unreasonably unsafe. But, but again, what I'd like to hear more from is a, a, a fulsome discussion of, of all of the requirements that we would need to, to make and, and go through any you know, feasible safety standards that, that, that may be applied. We need to be able to dismiss those arguments as well in I, order I think, to do what you're asking us to I do. I mean, I don't think any of us believe there is a feasible safety standard. Okay, but again, I'm, I'm not hearing that argument being made. I, I personally see bumper, bumper pads as being like smoking. As cigarettes. There is no reasonable benefit to smoking that outweighs the risk of smoking. And this is for a particular population. Um, and, and, and I think that one of the issues is that um, I talked about social norms before. People believe what the salesman is going to tell them. Okay, people believe that there is, that somebody has tested these and has made sure that they are safe for their baby. Nobody has done that. Nobody has done that. And by, by, by selling these, 
We are telling parents that this is safe, and parents believe that they are going to be judged because they don't buy these, because the salesperson is judging them because, oh, you're not going to buy that? But it could make your baby safer. And the last thing that a parent who doesn't know anything about parenting wants is to be judged. They don't want, their, they, they don't want the, the, to be judged. They want their child to be safe, and they want their child to be happy. Those are the three things that they want. And we're not helping them with any of these things. We're not making their child uh, safe. We're not making their child happy. And we're, you know, and by giving, by selling these things and then giving them a message that they're okay, we're giving parents a sense that they're being judged if they don't buy them. I hear what you're saying. And, and I think, too, if I, if I may, Commissioner Feldman, that having them on the market completely negates our counseling. When I meet with a family, um, you know, to me, the, my, the, the beauty of being a clinician is developing relationships over time and trust. Um, and for me to be able to sit in a room and say, all right, here's, here's what we know about safe sleep. Here's the safest thing you could possibly do. And then to have them go and be bombarded. And it is, it is social media, it's, it's the internet, and it's retailers. Anything that, that, that casts doubt or makes it easy for them to do something else, they will do. I've seen that repeatedly in the, in the car seat space. Um, and you know, the more I've gotten engaged in safe sleep, the more I'm seeing it here as well. That we need to, it needs to be consistent. And having products on the market that, that countermand what we know to be safe makes it fundamentally difficult and dangerous for babies. And we need to think about it from their perspective. Yes, but the standard for which we can ban a product isn't whether or not the existence of that product on the market is consistent with what the American Academy of Pediatrics is, is messaging is at, at, at any given moment, right? It's, it's a more involved process in order to, to proceed in a way under our statute with a ban that's going to be upheld. We need more than that. Can um, I just your time has expired, uh, and I, um, if I if I could, uh, you're, you're, you've you've run, you've run over. Oh. But if you want to make a final point, by all means, do that. Uh, I was just going to allow Nancy to to contribute, and I appreciate the, the consideration. I would just say that we are all working to get you what you need to do a ban. We're also working with Congress to do a ban that way. But CPSC in the past has banned a product with a standard, and that's infant bath seats. So instead of your staff coming up with reasons why these products should stay on the market, they could put that energy into writing a standard that would ban bumpers as we know them, require the same airflow as no bumper with any bumper that's in there. That's going to be impossible to meet. Require different things. You have done it before. You can do it if that's the way you want to go. But we are also trying to work on these other avenues. My time's expired. Um, and so we're, uh, I want to thank the first panel uh, for your excellent testimony. Uh, we will begin the second panel at 11.25, but I did uh, add, want to add one thing. And uh, Ms. Coles, you're a pretty good uh, f lawyer for not being a lawyer. Uh, there, there is no requirement that we address crib bumpers under Section 8. It's certainly one uh, possibility, but the discussion that we've been having is addressing them under Section 104, where the test is dramatically different. This is a point we can debate at some length. But again, I do want to thank the panelists uh, for your excellent testimony, and we will begin a testimony at 11.25 or so. We're going to take a quick break. Welcome back. Uh, I see uh, something that must be a set of slides that we were going to see on the screen up there. Uh, we welcome our second panel, uh, and we're going to go from my left to my right. And so, Ms. Jacobson, if you want to proceed. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Allison Jacobson, and I am the CEO of First Candle. We are the national nonprofit committed to ending sudden unexpected infant deaths, especially SIDS and accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed. I am also a SIDS mom. My son, Connor, died in 1997. And while I say I'm a SIDS mom, that might not actually be the case. At that time, I didn't know about the dangers of blankets and crib bumpers, and like so many other moms at that time, my son's Connor's crib was adorned with all of those things. 
At First Candle, we also have a 24-hour grief line and online support groups. And every day, I unfortunately have to welcome new members into a club none of us want to belong to. They share their stories, and their pain can be felt in every word. And unquestionably, the majority of their stories have a similar theme. Their baby was in bed sharing or was in his or her crib with a blanket or had crib bumpers in their crib. And not only is their grief palpable, but so is their guilt. They feel like they killed their baby. I had one mom ask me directly if she was going to hell. And sadly, they learned too late that bed sharing or having blankets or crib bumpers can cause their baby to suffocate. Perhaps the most heartbreaking comment is no one ever told me. And the most infuriating question is, if crib bumpers can cause my baby to suffocate, why are they sold? And this goes back to what we heard from the other panelists. They assume that if it's on the market, it's safe. And maybe that's not the case, but as a consumer, that's what we're led to believe. We also see, as one of the panelists said, things from Pottery Barn Cribs and all these beautiful layettes and crib bumpers, and we assume that's the norm. Every year, 3,600 babies die from sudden unexpected infant death, and currently 26% are caused by accidental suffocation or strangulation in bed, and another 36% are undetermined, which means they could have possibly been caused by suffocation or strangulation. Over the past decade, we have seen a 110% increase in accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed. These are deaths that can be prevented. There is no need for crib bumpers, and we have the ability to at least eliminate one risk. And that's why First Candle strongly urges the CPSC to ban these crib bumpers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Lesh? Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Jen Lesh, the CEO of Breathable Baby, a mesh liner manufacturer from Minnesota. Actually, chemist turned CEO. I bring that up because you'll find a lot of data, research, and that I'm a fan of products based on science. That's why I'm very proud to lead Breathable Baby. Let's take a step back to our origin. It goes back to 1999 when Dale and Susan Waters woke to a piercing cry and found their three-month-old Ciara with her leg wedged between the slats and her face pinned against the mattress. Based on advice from their pediatrician, they had no bumper. She was very active, continued getting stuck, and after many sleepless nights, they became desperate. And without a safe solution on the market, they took matters into their own hands to find a thin, breathable material. The idea for a mesh liner was born, and we were founded in 2002. Today, I plan to establish three things. First, mesh liners are substantially different than padded crib bumpers, both in construction and performance. Second, mesh liners are safe. There is no evidence to the contrary. And third, moms and dads want an entrapment solution. I will end with a, with a request that we, regardless of the standards you choose, our mesh liners be allowed to pass and continue providing a safe and reliable alternative to bumpers. Let's review the differences. Many spend time talking about the dangers of bumpers, but spend less time on the reasons why. The material and the construction, specifically two layers of fabric with inner fill. It's obvious fill is thick, but what's not obvious until under a microscope is it's not uniform. That means poor airflow out and the risk of rebreathing CO2 in. When fill is covered with fabrics, it can further restrict the airflow because the fill's openings misalign with the fabric's openings. Let's look at the samples I've provided. The pink bumper has zero permeability in cubic feet per minute, or CFM, as measured by ASTM D737. The fill alone is 32. The fabrics, both the zero. Not safe. On the other hand, the gray bumper, the outcome is the same, zero CFM. 
The fill in this case is 420 CFM, but the fabrics measure three and four. The result is lower than the parts and still unsafe. Different bumpers, same unsafe results, and demonstrative of the reason the water scoured the world to find the right fabric, and we've invested countless hours and dollars into research to refine our breathable mesh. Mesh is a single layer created by a process called warp knitting and commonly called a spacer fabric. Unlike the problems with fill, the 3D structure of mesh is open, uniform, and made entirely of interwoven strands of thin yarn. Our mesh has visible holes ranging from one to five millimeters wide, and the spacers make our mesh less than five millimeters thick to avoid presenting occlusion risk. That's one fifth of an inch versus a bumper that's up to two inches per allowable standards. Mesh liners are made from, sorry about that, Mesh liners are made from a completely different material and are engineered to be thin and highly breathable. A study by Vero Veritas in 2016 on the left tested four of our liners against 10 commonly available bumpers. Our classic mesh we still use in production today measured 1,031 CFM, nearly 25 times more permeable than the bumpers tested which range from 21 to 70. The NPR references a report that used test method BS4578 for infant pillows. The CPSC determined the testing was not useful in suffocation for bumpers, and we have no reason to disagree. However, the test did show that the pressure changes associated with mesh liners were undetectable at average infant airflow breathing rates of two liters per minute. The results on the right show a distinguishing line at 0 .003 inches on the chart. That separated liners from bumpers. Both BS4578 and D737 show a clear demarcation between liners and bumpers. We commissioned an environmental health expert to compare BS4578 results to D737 results and our specifications. He applied Darcy's law, which evaluates pressure drop and flow rate as a function of permeability. And this theory reaffirmed that an infant would not experience resistance through our liners. In fact, he noted our minimum specification of 700 is more than 15 times that distinguishing line noted in the report. That brings me to my second point, the safety of our mesh liners. We have sold over four and a half million mesh liners without a recall and without a single report of injury, death, or emergency medical attention. If each of these four and a half children slept in their crib overnight and took one daily nap for three months, that's over 800 million data points. Whether it's four and a half or 800, the incident rate is zero. We were very surprised to see in the NPR that it cited 15 non-fatal incidents that contain the word breathable or mesh. The details were not included, so we FOIA'd them and confirmed that none of them, none of the 15 presented suffocation hazards related to mesh liners. Three incidents were complaints unique to padded bumpers marketed as breathable. Fuzz in an infant's mouth, wood sliver in the padding, and a bumper that wasn't thick enough. Eight involved children getting their limbs entrapped in, in slats despite using a mesh liner. Two involved red marks from contacting or rubbing on the liner. One was an odor complaint, and one mentioned mesh in play yards and was unrelated to mesh liners. Moving on to my third point. We support bear is best, but not everyone will go bear. Caregivers want a solution. A 2015 consumer study showed 74% of moms with infants ranging from six to 12 months used a bumper or liner with one of the top reasons being to prevent entrapment. A 2019 study led by NJ Shears with moms of children under 24 months showed 90% of moms used a bumper or liner to prevent entrapment. Higher than our study in part due to age and demographic differences. 
37% of moms in this year's study reported entrapment, actual entrapment, not all of which ended in the ER. And she concluded moms with bumpers and liners were significantly like, less likely to experience slat entrapment. A forensic audit of the four CPSC databases by Econometrica estimated 280 ER-related entrapment injuries annually and noted that arm and limb entrapments account for over 50% of crib-related injuries reported to the CPSC. And what about those numerous entrapments that don't end in the ER because parents choose not to go or simply can't afford it? Entrapment incidents are real. Data derived from searching over 1,400 reviews on just one of our mesh liners shows over 200 reviews with comments related to entrapment and the tangible quality of life benefits provided by our mesh liners. In summary, crib standards have changed, slats are closer, but entrapment still occur. We need a safe solution for the over 200, or excuse me, 2 million slatted cribs sold every year. It shouldn't be bare or nothing. The risks of, it, of parent DIY and the unintended consequences, perhaps of a rolled up blanket, are real. Independent parties have reinforced that position, the position on the mesh liners, they don't pose the same risks as padded crib bumpers. A 2016 Journal of Pediatrics article by NJ Shears stated mesh liners are breathable and thin and may reduce, likely reduce the likelihood of slat entrapment. Her 2019 study reinforced this. Econometrica concluded mesh liners appear to provide a potent, potentially substantial safety ben benefit in the form of reduced numbers of limb entrapments without posing a potential suffocation risk. We respectfully request that regardless of the standard you choose, our mesh liners be allowed to continue providing a safe, reliable, and useful solution to remedy the real world issue of limb entrapments for babies and parents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Collier. Thank you, Chairman Adler and commissioners for the opportunity to share some unique data with you today. My name is Abby Collier and I am the director of the National Center for Fatality Review and Prevention, or National Center for short. We are a HRSA funded resource center um, and the information that I'm going to share with you are, is the perspective of myself and my agency, not the federal government. Our charge at the National Center is to support all aspects of fatality review. We do this in two key areas. The first is programmatic technical assistance. That's everything from a site visit to how to conduct a review. And the second piece is managing the National Fatality Review Case Reporting System, or Case Reporting System for short. And that's what I'm going to focus my time on today to tell you about the data that we collect. But before I do that, I want to explain the breadth of child death review in the United States. Currently, there's child death review in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia. These teams have one goal. They want to make their communities healthy and safe so families and children can thrive. Unfortunately, we do this by looking at how and why kids die. As you can see from the slide, there's just a great um, depth of individuals engaged in this work at the community level, the state level, and the national level. Child death review happens in sort of three key steps. I like to think of it as putting together a puzzle. The first thing we do is tell the story. Each individual child, one child at a time. Team members come prepared with information about the child and the family, and they share it. Everybody in the room shares what they know, and we put together the puzzle. Sometimes the picture makes perfect sense, other times we're missing pieces or it's an incomplete view. Once we've clarified everything we know, we collect data and then take action. What's unique about child death review is we bring together this diverse group of professionals, medical examiners and coroners, pediatricians, law enforcement, child welfare, local public health, and what we get is this multifaceted view of a child and a family, but also of our community in order to identify our systems and our gaps. Our child death review teams are charged with one thing, and that's to catalyze prevention. 
If you would have told me more than a decade ago this is where I'd hang my professional hat, I probably would have said no, but the prevention work is what keeps all of us going. I want to transition now to talk about the case reporting system. It is a free web-based data system used by fatality review teams in 45 states. The case reporting wow. system collects a unique set of data as well as a unique depth of data that is available to local and state users in real time. So often our teams are waiting for vital records or waiting for other official reports. When they're using the case reporting system, they can access it in real time, which allows them to identify trends in their community and immediately take action. As I said, it's used in 45 states. We have more than 2,100 users. It's quite a thick book of data questions. There's 2,600 variables, and we have more than 220,000 cases in the case reporting system. Data in the case reporting system is owned by the state that enters the data, but there is a process for researchers to access data to um, inform their research. In fact, Dr. Moon has published a number of papers on the data in the case reporting system. Obviously, we think the data in the case reporting system is valuable and unique, but I would be remiss if I didn't point out a few of its limitations. First and foremost, it's not population-based data, and we cannot calculate rates. There are very few states that enter 100% of their cases, and so we know we're not talking about an entire population. We also know that standards vary significantly across jurisdictions as to depth and quality of death scene investigations, what's kept in medical records, et cetera. There's missing and incomplete information. When you ask folks to answer 2,600 variables, by the time they get to the end of the form, they might be a little fatigued. Um, <clears throat> and that there's been multiple versions of the case reporting system since it launched. We're on version five, but version, the next version is on the horizon. I'll transition to talk a little bit now about how we collect information on sleep-related deaths. As Dr. Moon pointed out in her testimony, what is called an asphyxia in one jurisdiction might be called a SIDS in another jurisdiction, and it might be called unknown or undetermined somewhere else. In order to address this issue, we use a gatekeeper question asking if the death occurred in a sleep environment. This allows us to look at these cases regardless of cause and manner of death. So what you can see on the screen is where I've highlighted that gatekeeper question. We actually ask it for children younger than age five, although most sleep-related deaths happen to children younger than age one, there still is a couple that happen in that older group. We then go on to collect additional information about items in the sleep environment. So you can see, again, I've highlighted that we ask questions um, about what was in the environment and its relationship to the child. So we want to know everything in the environment, but more importantly, we really want to know its relationship to the airway. So we want to know if a blanket was present, but we want to know if a blanket was over the face. The same is true with bumper pads. <clears throat> Um, to better capture how and why the infant died, we've revised these questions, and in 2013, um, this current matrix was adopted, and it's still being used today, and what it allows us to do is notice something was present, if it impacted the airway, and if that um, airway impaction was partial or fully obstructed. So we found um, a total of 84 cases in the case reporting system where the bumper pad was clearly documented to have obstructed the airway. There are exponentially more cases that fall in that gray area. Bumper pad was present, but so was a blanket. We excluded those cases just for clarity's sake. When we looked at those 84 cases, we reviewed their narrative, and I'll talk more about that in a second, and we excluded any narrative that was unclear. So we really, the data that I'm gonna present to you on these 73 cases are really clear cut cases where the bumper pad impacted the death. We analyzed the data from 2008 to 2018 from 25 states. You can see the demographics up on the slide. Um, of note, we found the greatest risk for infants was between two and four months of age, which is consistent with testimony you heard this morning from our colleagues at the AAP. I also want to point out that we had a higher number of um, non-Hispanic black and um, Hispanic infants in the case reporting system based, uh, if we compare that to infant deaths. As expected, about 90% of these deaths occur in the parent's home, so kids are at home where they should be. It's important to note that 23% of infants in this subpopulation were born premature, and that um, in a typical population, we see about 10% of infants born premature, so it's an important finding to note. We also found that in most of these cases, 
parents were following at least one of the recommendations of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So just to highlight uh, Dr. Moon's point earlier this morning, we see how these deaths are signed out by medical examiners varying greatly. 52% um, are listed as accidents, followed by 30% undetermined. The same can be true for cause of death. We see about 50% of them listed as an external asphyxia, but then we get everything in that category from SIDS to unknown to an injury. So there's kind of great inconsistency. And again, the use of that gatekeeper question allows us to access this data regardless of how the medical examiner cites it out. We also look at how the infant was placed and found. We found um, by looking at this data that um, 31 of the infants were placed on their back to sleep, but only seven were found on their back. Um, what does account for that difference? Certainly some of the infants were developmentally able to roll. However, we know this is just a small number. We recognize that families know the message about babies sleeping on their back and might be giving a biased answer to medical examiners. Um, as we heard earlier, we know families want to do the best they can. When we looked at the deaths, we found that 27 of them had a partially obstructed airway, uh, 41 had a fully obstructed airway, and um, in the other cases, you'll see an asterisk, that number was less than six, which means we cannot release it. Um, in both of those cases, though, the bumper pad was listed in the narrative as obstructed, but not in the data portion of the form. One of the things we commonly hear is that death scene investigations are not collected on these infants. However, we want to point out in the cases that we're presenting on today, there was comprehensive death scene investigation occurring. We found that um, 96% or 70 of the 73 had a death scene investigation. Um, same, 96% uh, had an autopsy performed. And you can see as you read down the list, um, these cases were well investigated. In October of 2013, we added additional questions, and in the 20 cases that had those additional case questions, 50% had a doll reenactment, which is considered a best practice. I talked about the importance of a multidisciplinary review, and again, I want to bring you back to the um, quality of information available at the table for these cases. These communities were really able to create a comprehensive picture of what happened to these children. I want to end by talking about the narrative. There's a place in the case reporting system for teams to note a narrative. And this is where we clearly see the role of a bumper pad. And we found countless examples of a narrative noting um, that the infant was found um, fully obstructed in a bumper pad as noted in the first one on this slide. Thank you for the opportunity to share our data and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Fiebrick, right? And try to pass the, the laptop. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's going to yeah, move. You want to trade? Sure. We don't start the clock till you're ready. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Georgia Fiebrick. I am the founder of Go Mama Go Designs. Um, I'm also one of the co-owners along with five other physicians that own our company. Um, our company was founded in 2005 to create baby products that were safe and innovative to make parenting more simple and more enjoyable. Uh, creating a safe sleep environment was the foundation of, for many of the products that we came up with. And I personally had a negative experience with a traditional crib bumper, and I knew that there had to be a better solution. Uh, thus, our company created a vertical crib liner. 
Uh, we've sold 1.5 million vertical crib liners in the last 10 years without zero incident rate. Uh, we safely fit on almost any crib, a standard crib, round crib, stoka, oval, a mini crib, uh, convertible cribs, cribs with headboards, sideboards, and toddler cribs as well, without any need for manipulation to the product itself. We are excluded from all city and state bans, uh, including Maryland, as well as the recent ban in New York, uh, given our inherent safety and unique design. Uh, we simply remain outside the scope and definition of a traditional crib bumper. Um, contrary to the AAP's assumption that crib bumpers are not to be used or are used um, after six months, is simply not true for our product. Most parents are purchasing these products at the age of six months for their, for their children. Um, when the children are becoming increasingly mobile and hurting themselves in the crib, uh, that's when we see people purchasing our product and they can use our product indefinitely up to two years, three years, as long as they're in the crib. There is no safety uh, hazard not to use our product. We do not provide any instructions or warning labels to remove it at any given time. So um, that six month limit that applies to traditional crib bumpers absolutely does not apply to vertical crib liners. Um, the, a, the proposed ASTM standards, um, they simply just don't even apply to our product because we eliminate almost, if not every risk that they pertain to. Um, and the commission's proposed definition of, of, uh, of a crib bumper, um, our product remains outside that scope as well in the proposed definition. Um, here we go. Oh, thank you. Um, Vertical crib liners are the answer to this problem. We are the only safe option. We eliminate every fatal mechanism associated with horizontal bumpers, asphyxiation, strangulation, suffocation, and entrapment. Uh, we cover the full length of the crib rail, so we are actually serving a purpose in preventing and mitigating injury as uh, the baby grows and moves. Uh, we're preventing injury to the head, the face, the body as well. Um, we also close up the gap just a little between the crib rails that we do keep limbs uh, gently inside. And when by chance the limb does fall out, because we have the liner there, it allows them to retrieve it, retrieve it more easily. Uh, we also maintain the level of airflow equal to that of, uh, of a bare crib. We have done CO2 dispersion rate assessments by Intertech, one of the leading uh, toy or child product assessment facilities. Um, and I have provided that uh, before in the past, and I will provide it again in, uh, the, for the record. Um, so using our vertical liners is synonymous with using nothing on the crib as far as airflow. Uh, we also eliminate the risk of suffocation. Uh, we have a non-continuous convex design where the, um, the airflow uh, is never obstructed uh, among the nostrils and the mouth. And that is also in that intertech study um, compared to 100% of continuous surface area that, surface area, um, that a traditional bumper presents. Uh, we provide an optimum consistent amount of high density padding that is 3 eighths inch thick. That's 9.5 millimeters, less than a centimeter. It eliminates any confusing or senseless arguments about thick or thin. Um, there's no sagging. There's no firmness issue. Um, and because we zip on, tightly. Uh, there's no uh, argument about the length or strength of dangerous ties. That's also something that's totally irrelevant to our product. Most importantly, our product is impenetrable. The baby can root and scoot and push and crawl, and they cannot affect or manipulate or interact with the shape, the tightness, the adherence um, of a vertical crib liner. This attribute is life changing. No other horizontal bumper, whether it's mesh, thin, thick, can, nor, no continuous bumper can offer that guarantee. We were also recognized in the Journal of Pediatrics in November 2015. Uh, Dr. Thatch lauded us as a viable, safe option that seems to mitigate some of the problems found with the traditional crib bumpers. Uh, vertical bumpers slightly um, 
well, they wrap tightly around the crib rail, allowing airflow and reducing the likelihood of slat entrapment and climb outs. Uh, here are a few pictures of our product. Uh, they simply zip on. They don't really need a lot of instructions. As if a parent knows how to use a zipper, then they can pretty much accomplish putting our product on. It zips all the way down, and the zipper falls. Uh, the zipper pull falls below the mattress, inaccessible to a, to a child, and the pole tucks underneath the vertical crib liner itself. Thank you. Uh, we need to have an option because uh, there, there are thousands of reported injuries that, are, that take place in the crib. They may not lead, lead to death, but they do lead to injury, stress, pain, unhappiness, broken bones, bruises. A child that suffers nightly in a crib is not going to go happily into that environment. It also affects the quality of life for families and parents and children when uh, the, the parents and the children are not sleeping properly on a consistent nightly basis if a child is banging against the crib and hurting themselves. Uh, studies show that babies do want comfort almost over anything else. And I, as a parent, I have a need to comfort and protect my children. And I think that's a right that parents have, and I think it's a, a right that we need to consider. Um, you, when I was preparing for this uh, forum, I came across an article where a baby who was 11 months old came home from the hospital from Houston to San Antonio. He was born without skin, and he was finally coming home. Do we want to tell those parents that they can't have any thing in their crib to offer comfort and protection to that 11-month-old that's been in the hospital for 11 months. Um, also, what we haven't talked about at all are special needs families. There are over 20% of the U.S. households that have, some, have a child with some sort of medical challenge, whether that's hemophilia, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, autism, ADD. Uh, we have come across parents that have, uh, their children have lots of skin or disorders that I never even knew about. These parents are so grateful for our product. We are offering them something that's comforting and safe and protective to these children that are suffering already unnecessarily and are staying in their cribs for an extended amount of time. These are not babies. These are toddlers. These are four-year-olds, five-year-olds that still need to remain in a crib for their safety. Shouldn't we offer them something that comforts them? We also work with Kaiser Benton USA. They uh, create and design uh, residential and hospital cribs for special needs kids. We have worked with them directly. They are FDA approved kids. Their health insurance covers those beds and so does the health insurance cover the bedding as well. We also offer vertical crib liners in organic cotton. A lot of parents, uh, their kids have autism. They often choose only organic products and we can offer those to them. Uh, here are just a few pictures. On the right is the Kaiser Benton, and then here is just a, a regular hospital crib. You can see that if you're basically spending half your life uh, in a crib and you're an older four-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old, that comfort and protection would be uh, welcomed in that environment. Um, I think uh, everyone knows that a recall is long overdue. Uh, any, um, the ASTM stand suggested standards um, in the recent proposed ruling, um, I, th I think is baseless. Um, I, it's, the, it's the horizontal nature of a crib bumper, the traditional crib bumper, or any continuous bumper that is a faulty design, whether it's thick or thin. The definition of a crib bumper should just follow the lead of the other states and city bans that have occurred uh, and simplify the definition by just saying any continuous bumper uh, as part, as part of the, uh, the ban as you define it. Uh, the JPMA's argument that parents will make makeshift bumpers is simply untrue when you have a safe option. Um, I'm going to ask you to wrap mm -hmm. it up, please. Okay, sure. 
Um, my main point is that the CPSC needs to create a federal policy. Um, it is chaotic out there for manufacturers and uh, we just need a clear, concise message. And there is lots of evidence to suggest that vertical crib liners are safe. There's no lack of evidence out there. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Thank everybody on the panel. I did want to raise one quick comment before I ask questions that has to go with legal authority. And I simply want to state my view as a commissioner. Uh, I have zero interest in drafting a standard either under Section 7 or Section 9 of our Act or of Section 8. The consideration that we've been addressing is under Section 104, which I would point out does not require a finding that a product be an unreasonable risk of injury. It simply requires that we look to a voluntary standard after consulting with experts in the field, and then uh, we either incorporate the voluntary standard or make it more stringent. And that's the standard that I'm approaching, again, speaking only as one commissioner. I found the testimony today, in particular from this panel, to be fascinating. So, uh, Ms. Lesh, uh, I read in your testimony and, uh, that you said there's no, quote, direct evidence to indicate mesh liners are unsafe. And I always get nervous when I see a bit of a qualified statement. So, can I just say, uh, are you saying that you know of no incidents or allegations of harm from your product? I think you said that, but I just want to nail that down. Yes, we have n no known incidents related other than the ones that were presented in the NPR, but those were not a suffocation I risk understand. and none of the hazards we're discussing today. Um, I'm also intrigued by your statement that uh, the breathable baby crib liners po pose no climb out hazard, but they're horizontal. And why would there not be at least sometimes a climb out hazard from your liner? So our breathable liners are constructed of mesh that is very thin. I said less than five millimeters. They are constructed to actually collapse. They collapse to less than one inch. We have had studies done to compare that to bumpers, which collapse to two inches. Mm -hmm. And we found that the, um, we had 10 items commonly found in a crib, which even includes a hard doll, and those were about four inches of climb out. We've not seen any data to um, cite that ours prevent, present any climb out and are the lowest of the items that we measured. And then I would point to NJ Shear's uh, recent study that actually found no difference between liners, bumpers, and a bear crib for climb out, pointing to other factors. I guess one of the things that we're always trying to do is to figure out how to draw a line in terms of scientific data and uh, proper empirical assessment. So. Uh, my question is, uh, how would we draw a distinction about mesh liners that would uh, mean that other liners that purport to be mesh liners are not mesh liners? Do you have a permeability test or a thinness test? Yeah, we actually, we do, as I was stating, the five millimeters, there are tests to actually measure that, and that's the spacer, the spacer controls that. Um, and then we actually use even in our company, we bought um, a, a machine that actually tests ASTM D737. So that is the permeability test for infant bedding that we would suggest a standard around. Thank you very much. Ms. Collier, I'm so delighted to see you here, and I'm particularly delighted to see that you have a free web-based source of data. I wish that we had other government entities uh, or government-funded entities that did the same. It's really hard to get fatality data on a timely basis uh, from, say, the National Center for Health Statistics, so you are a godsend. Uh, with that in mind, I'm curious, did you try to assess whether the degree to which there's overlap between the fatality data that you have and the fatality data that CPSC has? We, we did not because the data that we can see is de-identified, including by state. So we have no ability to really cross. Well, I, we're going to hear from Dr. Thatch, but somewhere I seem to recall that he did have some ability to draw a distinction. Have you looked at his testimony? Do you have any uh, thoughts about that? And I believe that Dr. Thatch got permission from each individual state to have it identified to him. So currently, when a researcher requests data from us, they get it uh, de-identified, including by state. However, um, a researcher can ask for an identified variable, and the states have to give permission. Um, Dr. Thatch's study occurred before my tenure at the center, but I'm fairly confident that's how 
he navigated that. Well, I would hope that would be how we would navigate, that we would take your information and whatever information we're getting from separate sources so that uh, we can have a fairly clear idea of the degree of overlap. But again, I'm so delighted to listen to your testimony. Um, I would like, uh, Ms. Fiebrick, uh, you, you made a statement, and I, I just want to make sure I understood it. You said that only half of the deaths from crib bumpers could be avoided with the use of mesh liner. And that goes contrary to the testimony we've heard. Did I misread what you said? Uh, yeah, I did not have a, a chance to raise that point, but in the, um, the CPSC reports, um, staff response to record of commission action on crib bumpers in September 16th. Uh, it not only verifies that vertical crib liners would have prevented four, possibly six of the nine deaths um, had they been used instead of a traditional crib bumper. The other situation of uh, vertical liners could not be used. But it did confirm that in five of nine cases, continuous mesh bumpers presented the same strangulation and hanging hazard as a traditional crib bumper. Uh, Ms. Lesh, may I, I, I don't want to get into a debate, but I'm just curious if you have a reaction to that. I, I, sorry about that. Um, I haven't looked at the particular sighting that you're talking well, about. Then but a minimum, may I ask you that you do examine the testimony uh, and that if you have anything additional to add that you would submit yeah, that. I, I absolutely. That. Um, one of the things, Ms. Fiebrick, that uh, I'm curious about is um, I don't see that there are any limits on the thickness of vertical uh, bumper pads, do you think there ought to be some limit to the thickness? Because I could imagine somebody getting carried away with the notion of a vertical bumper pad and introducing a level of risk. We actually have the patent on the vertical crib liner. So we are the only makers of the product. And we make them consistently uh, at, that, at that same level of padding, which we find is an ideal padding. Um, so it's illegal to sell them uh, on our the patent guidelines. I would not presume to be an expert on patent law, but it is interesting to hear that you have uh, uh, that, uh, that patent and maybe that would present, prevent that. Um, and again, I just need to be absolutely certain, is it your contention that never ever has there been a, an injury or a fatality associated with a vertical crib liner? That's absolutely correct. And they've been on the market since 2008, since for 12 years. Um, I really appreciate that, um, and um, I can't believe those are all the questions I had because I thought I had uh, a million of them, but you've actually answered those, so I'm going to defer now to uh, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you as well to the panelists. I think it's been uh, extremely helpful. Uh, I wanted to start with uh, Ms. Collier, if I can. Is there a mechanism in your system by which we can uh, receive alerts when there are new incidents that you've categorized with bumpers? That's a great question, Commissioner Kay. We do have a variable in the case reporting system that asks if um, the death might have been attributed to an issue with a product, and then there's some subsequent questions that appear. We provide extensive training to all of our teams around that variable. So if they're checking that variable, we're encouraging them to report that back to the Consumer Product Safety Commission staff in their state or region. Um, as far as an automated alert, I think you know that's something we could discuss uh, how that could occur. Well, I think that, and I don't want to speak for the staff or the other commissioners, but I know that my office in particular, we would like to figure out a way that's not burdensome for you, that we could at least figure out how we could hear about more incidents and, and see where the numbers are going. We'd be happy to have that conversation. That'd be great. We'll follow up with you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Jacobson, thank you as well for your testimony and certainly your personal experiences as well. I was curious to know what your opinion of the mesh bumpers and the liners are. At First Candle, um, we follow the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations. Um, my feeling in particular, and again, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a researcher, is it's the, the breathability factor. And in my opinion, if, if something's breathable, 
um, then it would be used by the parents. I think more importantly, though, is um, the fact that many people have stated here is parents want a solution. Parents are exhausted, and whether there is a imminent danger of harm, they perceive there's a danger of harm in um, their entrapment or, or using, you know, getting limbs entrapped. So they're going to use something. Um, so I think it's important to have something that will give parents a sense of comfort, but at the same time be safe. That's fair and well said. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Lesh, on the question uh, you mentioned in response to Chairman Adler's question that you have a permeability test, I think more specifically what we have been looking for to address a 104 standard would have to do with airflow and coming up with a test method that would accurately and repeatedly measure airflow. Does your test method speak to that? So that's the ASTM test method, and it does report airflow, um, or it reports CFM. The work we recently had done by the environmental uh, controls expert also does create a relationship between the infant's airflow and the CFM. That's the use of Darcy's law which is something that can be looked at in relation to what level of CFM to set based on the infant breathing rates that we're trying to consider. I see. And certainly, if you look at the package, if you see gaps in terms of the test method or the test specifications, whether it's relying on ASTM or others, please feel free to submit those comments during the rest of the comment period. Thank you. And then, uh, Ms. Freebrick, I want to thank you as well for coming in. I think we met a long time ago yes. in then Commissioner Adler's office when I was a staffer for Chairman Tenenbaum. So it's good to see you again. I am watching online. I wanted to thank you for pointing out and bringing it to our attention the impact on the regulatory actions on special needs families. As a family with a special needs child, that I pay particular attention to that and it's not something that normally comes up in our discussions. And so hopefully you've given us something to continue to think about as we look at uh, properly addressing these issues without impacting families with needs. So thank you for that. Of course. Uh, Chairman Adler, that was it for my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Biacco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Jacobson, thank you for sharing your experiences with us. It takes an incredible amount of courage, and I do appreciate that. Uh, I do agree with a lot of the things that you said. Uh, that no matter how educated you are, no matter what you know, parents do look for a solution for something that they perceive. I can't tell you how many things that, you know, the, the one that just jumps into my mind is, you know, you're not supposed to put whiskey on a baby's gums, but man, if that baby's crying, you'll try anything. And, you know, I, I'm not advocating for that, of course, but I, I do appreciate that. And, and you know, as I was sitting here and watching one of the slides that came up, and I can't remember who put that up there, the um, hospital crib it was very, brought back some memories. My, my little one was in the hospital. And you know, I put a bunch of shit, oh, stuff in that crib to comfort her. Nobody at the hospital ever told me to take it out, which I, I think is kind of interesting. And I have been going through pictures lately for another reason. And Look, when I came to this job, I realized all the mistakes that I made as a mother, and there are a lot of them. Um, and I'm not, I can't remember back that far whether I made them on purpose or I just didn't know, but you do make mistakes, and we do have to make sure that we, we account for that um, because we are going to have parents who do take, to take steps and to do take things into their own hands. So I, I do appreciate all of your comments uh, in, in that regard. And uh, Ms. Fiebrick, I also, um, like Commissioner Kay, the, the special needs kids issue is something we don't think about enough. They are yet another vulnerable population that we, um, have, that we are supposed to consider. Uh, children, uh, just children or just babies, are not the only vulnerable um, group of uh, consumers or product users that um, we should be looking at. And I thank you for bringing that to, your t to our attention, because I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective. It's a very good point. Um, we, we hear from them all the time, and they are looking for an answer. Uh, they yeah, really that, are. that makes sense. We get long letters written to us about what a difference the product made for them. It's an excellent point. Um, Ms. Collier, I have a couple questions for you. Um, do, does Maryland participate in your 
um, program? It does. So I'd be interested to know my last question, if there, do you have data um, on just Maryland? I mean, can I get on there and look all that up? So as I said, states retain the right to their data. Um, and the case reporting system does not have a public interface where people can query data. We connect them with their state. Um, if they're interested in state-specific data, we connect them with that, or we provide analysis. We'd be happy to talk with you about a way to look at that data. OK, because you know, I, I agree with Commissioner Adler's. I, I was going to ask the same question of whether there was a comparison between your data and, and what we looked at, because there has to be. I find it hard to believe there wouldn't be some overlap. Um, and I'd be interested in that, and which brings me to my next question. You have in here that you identified a number of deaths where a bumper pad is indicated as involved. What does that mean exactly, as involved? So when we looked at um, a number of variables, we looked at the relationship of the bumper pad to the infant's airway. So if the infant was found, let's say, on their back in the middle of the crib, um, and the airway was noted as um, unobstructed, we wouldn't consider that to be the bumper pad was involved. So really what we looked at were cases where the bumper pad was not only present, but in a position that it could have contributed to the infant's death. So those would largely be cases where it's noted that the bumper pad partially or fully obstructed the infant's airway. And would um, in those cases, did you consider whether there was a space, for example, between the bumper pad and the mattress, or whether there were blankets or toys or other, other factors? So we would look at those cases, and we'd look to see um, what was noted in the narrative, and particularly if a doll reenactment was done. So this is where mm -hmm. law enforcement or the medical examiner have the family use a, a doll to, as a way to position, um, to demonstrate the position of the child. So it would be noted in the narrative if there was a gap um, or in the photo that they can upload. Okay. So the medical examiner's conclusion is always something that, that troubles me because they don't always make a conclusion that is consistent with what we're looking for. I mean, you could say that someone died of a you know, pulmonary embolism, but that doesn't mean it was caused by a product or that it wasn't caused by a product. So th that, that particular conclusion doesn't always tell us what, what we need to know. So I do appreciate that there's um, additional points. Um, what was the time period involved for the number of, of deaths you discussed? So we looked at, <clears throat> excuse me, we looked at deaths from 2008 to, I just want to make sure that I'm correct, okay. um, 2008 to 2018 from 25 states. So although 45 states use the case reporting system, some do not allow us to use their data for research. So, so just 25 states. Mm -hmm. How do I know what those 25 states are? Um, we do not identify states without their permission. So if you wanted okay. to know what 25 states those are, we would go back to them and ask their permission. Okay. Why, why is that, just out of curiosity? Uh, we recognize that the data put into the case reporting system contains a number of identifiers. It's also uh, very protected data under a number of laws. Right. We also recognize, I, I myself as a mom, um, I would want to know that if my child's data was in here, it was very hard to identify my child and use that data. EII type of thing. OK, it's helpful. Um, does your data, oh, what are the five states that don't participate? Sure, so they're Kansas, North Dakota, Maine, Vermont, and North Carolina. Is there a particular reason? I'm just curious. Yeah, so the main reason is that they have legislation that prohibits them from sharing data with an outside entity. In fact, two of our staff are in Kansas right now testifying before their state legislature to help them change their law. OK, thank you. Um, Ms. Loesch, I you mentioned something that caught my attention, and that was with regard to um, mesh on play yards. How does your particular um, product compare um, to mesh on play yards? Sure. We actually use a few different mesh, but the primary mesh that I uh, referred to in the slide was a classic mesh, and that's very similar. So ours range anywhere from three to five millimeters. Play yards may be a little thinner, but they're constructed in the same way. And the one thing about spacer fabrics to note is it's not necessarily the thinness that can contributes to the breathability. If you imagine a 3D structure, it's the interaction of the holes and the spacers and actually the angles of the spacers. So it's a very similar type of mesh using the same construction process of warp knitting. 
I would assume, but I don't know, that you've made some comparisons in, in the data that's out there, because there's a decent amount of data out there for play yards. Comparisons to? Um, uh, injuries, uh, whether there have been any deaths, um, whether the testing uh, standards are the same. Yeah. Yes, and we actually test our mesh to play yard standards on force, and that's why we set those holes the way they are, so fingers and toes can't, can't get caught in okay. the mesh. All right, I think, um, I think that's it for now. Thank you very much. We're doing great on time, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, and uh, again, thanks to everybody on the panel for being here today. This is a, a useful discussion and, and hearing about what you're uh, working on in, in terms of products and, and, and research is, is really useful to CPSE as we grapple with these issues. Um, I had a number of questions, and I'm not exactly sure where to start, but um, I think I'll start with you, uh, Ms. Fiebrick. Um, so looking at the vertical liners and the way that you're marketing your product, the price point, um, sort of your target audience in terms of focus on special needs, do you consider yourself to be in the same product category as crib bumpers? I think at times we serve the same purpose, um, but really hearing how um, the first panel believed that crib bumpers did not serve a use after six months, it, that distinction is, is so great compared to our product and the use of our product and the, and the, the parents that purchase it. Um, that, I mean, that's definitely a distinction is the, the limit of use and the primary use of it. Uh, and uh, I think the number one distinction as well is whether it's continuous or non-continuous, basically horizontal versus vertical. Okay, so you, you think that you're in a distinct product category, but have concerns that you're, you, you may well get swept up in a, a broader that, regulation. That's been our goal. I mean, our goal is to provide a solution to a traditional crib bumper. Um, we had to market ourselves sort of in the same category. This is an issue we constantly deal with retailers. They're putting us in crib bumpers. We've had to go, we are actually uh, in, in the state of, for the state of Maryland, Amazon um, has still a few of our products based simply on color um, that are not exempt. Uh, so we are being tormented by these state bans because we're constantly having to work with the legislatures and um, show the exemptions to the retailers because we are different. Sure, uh, but the discussion that I'm hearing today, and uh, Ms. Loesch, I, I wanna get to you as well. Um, the, the, the experience that you're having with your sales data and, and marketing of your products does speak to what the consumer demand is for the product. Yes, and uh, I mean, we constantly get calls. It's like a, a hotline, people wanting our product. People are confused, uh, and, and, and actually a lot of parents that we dis we talk to know that they cannot use a, a traditional crib bumper. So they're calling us for a solution because they know they can't use the other one. Um, so let me let me ask it another way. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I heard that, uh, that, that both Breathable Baby and uh, Go Mama Go designs have been successful in um, seeking uh, a carve out or, or special treatment under the Maryland ban, for instance, or in, in New York. Um, in those states where there's a state ban in place, uh, and I think this speaks to sort of the elasticity of consumer demand, what are you seeing in terms of, in, in terms of growth or not of, of, of sales of your products in those states where you can buy them, but, but there's a broader uh, bumper ban in place. I think New York is gonna be the biggest change maker. Uh, we should see a demand. We haven't quite seen that just yet. I mean, it's gonna be a, probably a, a slow increase. It's not gonna happen overnight. Um, also because we sell third party as a wholesaler to Amazon, Bye Bye Baby, Walmart. Uh, we don't know sometimes where those products are going sure. to, but um, you know, as, we, we do see, uh, and I, I think with Maryland, the fact that the infant mortality rate is going down um, it, within this special situation, while my product is still available, uh, you know, proves that I'm not having a, 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 a negative effect on that. It's strictly positive. Ms. Lush, are you seeing similar? 
We haven't seen anything that would statistically say that is driving incremental demand. Um, I will say, however, there if you look at Amazon reviews, so we also sell on Amazon, um, you see parents commenting on with the ban, which are from those states. So you'll see some comments like that on Amazon. So people are aware. I don't see that it's driving, you know, significant incrementality by way of, you know, moving demand from bumpers to liners. I think what why that is, is that people are becoming aware when a state law is passed that there's some other consideration set or some other considerations that um, should happen. But you're seeing would-be bumper customers expressing interest and demand for both of your products? Yes. Correct. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I, I want to get to Ms. Collier, and I, I want to be uh, respectful of the time. Um, I, I'm glad you're here, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to hear about the work that the National Center is doing um, and the CDR teams and, and the work that your uh, fetal infant mortality review process ha has to bear. Um, sort of echoing what Commissioner Biaco was getting into um, and sort of hearkening back to the conversation that we were having on the first panel, um, I, I think for the purposes of this discussion, it matters what we're seeing in Maryland. Um, because uh, the, the, I heard it characterized on the, on the first panel that yes, there's Maryland data, but it's confusing. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know that that supports a conclusion one way or the other with respect to the efficacy of the Maryland ban. So I, I would ask it, it, it this way. Has Maryland allowed any of its data to be de-identified? Um, I would have to go back and check with 45 states using the case reporting system and all the nuances. I don't have it all off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to go back and look at what their allowances are. OK, I, I appreciate that, because I, I think that's a, a missing piece of information that would be incredibly useful for us to take a look at. Um, the other question that I had uh, had to do with sort of what your CDR uh, teams are finding and, and how you deal with whether or not there's medical reporting bias with respect to a number of these incidents. I couldn't think of a more traumatic experience than to, to, to come and find a, a situation where there's a positional asphyxiation death. Um, but when you're dealing with that and when there's uh, victim families that are involved, particularly in, in, in instances where those fatalities are uh, occurring, where it's sort of um, a, a, a demonstrable lack of, of, of compliance with any of the AAP or CPSC safe sleep recommendations, is that reflect, reflected in, in re reporting bias that, that those fatalities get coded a certain way? So I think that we see bias in how death certificates are signed, regardless of what type of death we're talking about. I think what is unique about child death review teams is that they have the opportunity to put together this multifaceted picture of what happened. And so what we often see is that they uncover and expose those biases that are inherent in our systems. So as a community, they can talk about them and they can um, provide education and training to try to overcome them. Your point about vicarious or secondary trauma for our first responders is one that is near and dear to my heart as a mental health clinician. Sure. Um, we know this work is so challenging for them. We provide a lot of coaching and we hear, particularly from law enforcement, that fatality review teams are the place they can go and they can let their guard down and talk about how hard it was, right? It, you know, back at the station, it's just a part of everyday life, but in this prevention-oriented group, they can have a place to share the challenges. And again, that's just a unique facet of this work. Well, it's important work that you're doing. I, I hope you continue it. Uh, I have no further questions, but I thank you all for being here. I'm sorry, Ms. Jacobson, if that's you wanted to. That's okay, I wanted to comment on that. Um, Barb Himes, who is our Director of Bereavement and Education, is in Indiana, and she sits on the Indiana Fatality Review Board. And you're absolutely right. There is a lot of bias, and especially when you're looking at coroners in certain areas, very small communities, very tight-knit communities, um, there's a bias, quite frankly, when it's a non-Hispanic white, and they don't want to say that it's accidental suffocation. As I said, we have many people in our support group who feel guilty as it is. On the other side, when it is non-Hispanic black, there is a lot of time where um, DCF will get involved, and there is. So, there are those challenges. I will also tell you that in the time when there is the, between the time there's the autopsy and the death, 
Um, there's a lot of chatter online of it has to be SIDS, it has to be SIDS, and then they're posting the pictures of their baby in the crib with bumpers and blankets and everything else, and it, it just makes me cringe. Um, I, I think that that highlights yet another challenge that that we're going to have to grapple with as we're as we're addressing the issue and making decisions. Um, again, appreciate you all being here and, and, and sharing your testimony. Thank you. We can't thank you enough. It's another terrific panel. Uh, we are now going to take a lunch break. Uh, and uh, we will set aside almost an hour. It's about 12.36, according to my watch. We will reconvene at 1.30. So again, we thank the panel very much. While we're waiting for the panelists to be seated, uh, Commissioner Kay, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, okay. uh, Chairman Abbott. Terrific. Thanks. Okay, we're going to begin uh, the uh, third and last panel of the day. Uh, you see that no one is sitting in Dr. Thatch's seat. That's because he's going to be in touch with us uh, via telephone. Uh, so, Mr. Dickerson, if you would like to proceed. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm James Dickerson, PhD. I forgot Excuse to me, Dr. Dickerson. Nah, it's okay. <laughs> I earned it, but my head's not that big. <laughs> uh, I'm, the, I'm a physicist. I'm also the chief scientific officer for Consumer Reports, and I'd like to thank uh, the CPSC and the commissioners for giving us the opportunity to speak to you today about this topic. Uh, as you may know, Consumer Reports uh, is an independent organization that's been around since 1936, and in our mission, we work uh, with consumers in the marketplace to make sure that the world is fairer, safer, and more transparent. And on this topic of safer, particularly regarding safe sleep, uh, we find uh, the issue of crib bumpers to be particularly concerning. So uh, as I've mentioned, uh, our issue is that the, uh, that our issue is that uh, we ensure that uh, safe sleep should be at the center of uh, ooh, lots of, so lots of background info. That's usually me, <laughs> so <laughs> we're very so forgiving at the moment. No, that's all right. No worries, no worries. Uh, so uh, consumers, particularly families, parents, and caregivers, uh, have in their minds that products that are available to them uh, in the marketplace should be intrinsically safe. They have this expectation uh, that every product that they're available to them has not only intrinsic safety uh, associated with it, but someone out there in the world has verified that those products are safe. We know that's not necessarily the case given the, the fact that there are products that uh, have been attributed to injuries and deaths, uh, in this case, to children. And so uh, it is our contention that the marketplace ultimately fails uh, families and children uh, when unsafe products, particularly unsafe sleep products, uh, remain available uh, to them for purchase. Now, if you think about it, uh, well-meaning parents, well-meaning caregivers, can have the intent to purchase something that will make their children, their infants, their toddlers safer. But in fact, uh, because they believe that these products are intrinsic, intrinsically safe because they're available, in fact, they might be doing uh, exactly the opposite of their intent, even though in their mind they're trying to do the right thing. And so uh, from this point of view, uh, Consumer Reports uh, asserts that uh, crib bumpers as a product uh, category contribute directly to unsafe sleep practices and unsafe sleep environments that really can be prevented. Uh, there's, uh, from previous panels uh, during this forum, there's been a multitude of evidence that's been provided uh, I have no intent to reiterate that which is 
uh, already in the public record, uh, but it's clear uh, that many organizations, including AAP, uh, believe uh, and provide uh, data, science, uh, that crib bumpers really have no place in uh, the marketplace. Even data from the Consumer Product Safety Commission staff uh, indicates that there are a number of fatal incidents as well as uh, injurious but non-fatal incidents that are tied to crimp uppers. Consumer Reports' own investigation uh, identified 23 fatalities during the 2012 to 2018 period uh, that uh, were linked directly to crib bumpers. And so uh, our assertion is that this data is present, this data is unequivocal, and it's quite clear uh, of the potential harm to children because of these products. Another issue that we have to consider is that the consumer, not the educated consumer that is completely knowledgeable about all of the nuances, all of the, the data that's available from government or other uh, entities in the marketplace about the state of crib bumpers, but the average regular consumer are wholly confused by the messaging that's out there, messaging of bear is best, the messaging of safe sleep, but then information that they may receive about injuries and deaths associated Dr. with Dr. Dickerson, excuse me one second. Um, somebody who is on the line, it's either Commissioner Kay or Dr. Thatch, we can hear rustling and breathing on the phone. So if we could ask you to mute uh, your phones, that would be uh, helpful. And I apologize. We'll give you an extra 10 seconds. No problem at all. So in knowledge of this, Consumer Reports decided to do their own investigation. So we have a standing panel of 1,000 consumers out there in the marketplace. And we identified of those 1,000 uh, panelists that we engaged, 240 of uh, them uh, identified as parents. And so we wanted to ask them what they understood uh, regarding safe sleep, regarding crib bumpers, and regarding best, uh, bear is best, those messaging. So what's the interlacing of those three concepts? And what we found was that 73% of parents believe that bearer is best message makes sense with respect to infant uh, sleep safety. However, a little bit lower than that, only 55% of parents believe that it's unsafe to use crib bumpers uh, with regarding uh, safe sleep. So there's a gap between those that say bear is best makes sense, but crib bumpers are okay too. So we, we found a gap of about 20%, and we feel that that gap of 20% that have an understanding of bear is best conceptually, but also don't see crib bumpers as a particular issue might be a notable issue that we, we all uh, in the marketplace, all parts of the marketplace need to address. And we also need to address it in terms of our messaging. Clarity, consistency, and conciseness in our messaging. We're aware that uh, states, stores, you know, distributors of products, uh, the House of Representatives all recognize risks associated with crib bumpers. Uh, as it's already been stated uh, during today's forum, uh, states like Maryland, uh, Ohio, and New York State have all uh, banned crib bumpers, uh, and other states are considering legislation associated with this. Uh, the U.S. House has passed the Safe Sleep for Babies Act uh, uh, last month, and we at Consumer Reports wholly support uh, that bill and hope that there is notable progress when it goes to uh, the Senate. Uh, to be somewhat critical of the CPSC, uh, even though we see the CPSC as partners in many endeavors, we feel that uh, we and other of our 
and partners in the space have called for quite a long time for the uh, prohibition, the removal of crib bumpers from the marketplace. But unfortunately, there hasn't been, to our mind, significant action uh, for years and years and years on this particular issue. So we're here to, again, apply pressure uh, to the CPSC and others to help us uh, ensure that these products uh, are ultimately removed from store shelves. We believe that uh, the hard work that CPSC staff uh, has done, has invested in the briefing package is uh, greatly appreciated. So we, we are here to, to partner uh, in that respect, to uh, pr uh, provide as much uh, support as we can, given that briefing that we think is a, a very strong step forward. Uh, but the issue is, is that uh, the proposed rule as we see it uh, is, is quite intricate and, and complicated. Uh, but ultimately isn't strong enough. And so it's associated. Uh, could you turn that off, please? Could you turn the... We'll give you an extra 10 seconds again. <laughs> All's good. I used to be a professor, so I'm, I'm used to lots of interruptions, so no worries at all. Uh, we believe that it, uh, the weakness of the proposed rule could end up leading to greater confusion uh, and ultimately additional delays in having a resolution on this matter, something that we feel, given the severity uh, of this topic, that any delay uh, is too much of a delay. We really want to see resolution as soon as possible. So to conclude, uh, a multi-component uh, 10 minutes. Uh, crib bumpers, in our point of view, should not be for sale, full stop. Let me say it again, because maybe it was not clear. Crib bumpers should not be for sale, full stop. We thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. I'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, and again, uh, thank you for all of your, your efforts. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kay, questions? Uh, I don't think it's actually my time. I think it's actually the next witness. Oh, uh, my turn. No, no, I'm sorry. Strike that. Yes, next witness. Sorry. Got a little distracted there. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Kelly Mariotti, Executive Director of the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association. I'm also a mom, former owner of a baby products manufacturing company that made, among other things, cribs, cradles, and soft goods, including bumpers. And I'm also the former CEO of First Candle and a longtime board member, an organization we heard from earlier today. The issue of safe infant sleep has been a common thread throughout my career, and I've had the unique opportunity to consider it from a variety of perspectives. About 3,600 American babies die in their sleep every year for reasons that remain mostly elusive. Eliminating those deaths is a personal passion and a goal we all share. JPMA is a national not-for-profit trade association representing 95% of the prenatal to preschool industry, including the producers, importers, and distributors of a broad range of childcare articles that provide protection to infants and assistance to their caregivers. JPMA collaborates on programs to educate consumers on the safe selection and use of juvenile products. Promoting baby safety is a key mission of the association. In May of 2012, more than seven and a half years ago, JPMA petitioned the commission requesting that rulemaking be initiated that defines and distinguishes between hazardous pillow-like crib bumpers and non-hazardous traditional crib bumpers. CPSC voted in May of 2013 to grant the petition and directed staff to initiate rulemaking to address the risk of injury associated with the use of crib bumpers and to provide the commission with a briefing package that described the possible regulatory options the commission could take to address the risk of injury associated with these products. Four years later, in a report dated September 9, 2016, titled CPSC Staff Response to the Record of Commission Action on Crib Bumpers, was released. You've heard from several people today that consumer demand for these products does exist, and it exists to solve real problems. 
The report itself stated that crib bumpers are generally used as, promoted, as providing two safety benefits, preventing infants from getting their limbs caught between crib slats and protecting infants from impacts against the sides of a crib. During rulemaking activities for full-size and non-full-size baby cribs, CPSC staff found that infants getting their limbs caught between crib slats accounted for many incidents involving cribs, and bumpers likely prevent some incidents and injuries involving limb entrapment. The staff also stated that eliminating crib bumpers might result in some caregivers using soft bedding as an alternative protective barrier against the crib structure because consumers have been known to engage in similar behaviors, even in the presence of contrary warnings in the sleep environment. This report also concluded that 72 of the 107 reported fatal incidents are unlikely to be addressable by commission action. Thus, improved performance requirements or even a ban are unlikely to have had an effect on these deaths. In contrast, nine of the 107 reported fatalities are likely to be addressable to some degree. Some portion of 26 additional fatalities may or may not be addressable by action. CPSC's report did not justify a ban on crib bumpers. Further, the conclusion noted that finding that crib bumpers present an unreasonable risk of injury would likely prove difficult, although this finding would be required to pursue rulemaking under the CPSA or FHSA. On October 19, 2016, believing that rulemaking could be justified, the Commission voted to add to its fiscal year 2017 operating plan a direction to staff to initiate a rulemaking under Section 104 of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008, CPSIA. Crib bumpers are not listed among the products in Section 104F, yet using the 104 process allows for the regulation requested by JPMA in its 2012 petition and desired by many stakeholders. Commissioner Adler wrote a very well thought out and clear opinion justifying regulation under 104. Section 104B of the CPSIA requires the Commission to first examine and assess the effectiveness of voluntary consumer product safety standards for durable infant or toddler products in consultation with representatives of consumer groups, juvenile product manufacturers, and independent child product engineers and experts, and promulgate consumer product safety standards for durable infant or children's products. Section 104F1 of the CPSIA defines the term durable infant or toddler product and specifies 12 categories of products that fall within the definition. The Commission's fiscal year 2017 operating plan directed staff to propose to amend the definition of durable infant or toddler product to include crib bumpers. Note here, the contrary to testimony this morning stating that no one is testing these products, there is much testing and research done on crib bumpers. Regulation under Section 104 will also require pre-market third-party testing be conducted. Pursuant to Section 104B, CPSC staff has consulted with the required stakeholders in the development of the NPR, largely through the ASTM process. ASTM F1917 subcommittee members represent producers, users, consumers, government, and academia. Utilization of ASTM safety standards is recognized as an effective approach to address consumer hazards, especially applicable to juvenile products. Staff began the consultation process for this rulemaking in December 2016 in a letter to ASTM requesting that the F15-19 subcommittee on infant bedding form task group make improvements to the standard related to three areas, firmness requirements, airflow requirements, and warning and instructional requirements, and to initiate activities to update ASTM F1917-12 with more stringent requirements that will further reduce the risk of injury associated with crib bumpers. Since then, CPSC staff has been actively participating in the ASTM subcommittee activities to address these issues. The updated standard to be published shortly includes most of the staff recommendations cited in the September 4, 2019 proposed rule and briefing package. In this regard, we recommend that the rule voted upon should reference ASTM F1917-20. JPMA's position is that all crib bumper pads and liners should already meet ASTM voluntary standard requirements per ASTM F1917 
and that caregivers using these products should always follow the instructions of the manufacturer and heed the warning and usage statements. The risk factors noted by Dr. Thatch in his original study, which was based on data from 2005 and prior, have already been addressed in this version. The evidence on the record indicates that notwithstanding improvements to the ASTM standard, as a legal matter based upon the record and previous vote of the Commission, the Commission would have been justified in acting earlier and approving a mandatory rule based upon ASTM F1917-12. However, in an ongoing effort to create the safest products and to support the rulemaking process for which we petitioned, JPMA has taken the lead in discussions to further enhance F1917 and has worked diligently to facilitate collaboration with the CPSC human factors staff, bedding and crib bumper manufacturers, and other parties participating in the process. As the ASTM process is one of continual improvement, we will continue to champion improvements to the standard, including additional performance requirements, such as air permeability thresholds. Following the Section 104 process through ASTM, ASTM can accomplish this much more quickly than CPSC rulemaking. Commissioner Kay said earlier that we may ask today what has taken so long, and indeed that is our question. The failure of the Commission to act in a timely manner is troubling. JPMA petitioned for rulemaking to set uniform national standards for crib bumpers and has encouraged the expediency of this process since 2012. It has languished for nearly eight years. Continued inaction by the Commission is not justified. While reasonable persons can interpret data differently, this seems not to be the case here. Unfortunately, there appears to be an effort to altogether ban products rather than establish reasonable standards for products as required under the very law the Commission voted to proceed under more than three years ago. We would also like to take this opportunity to urge the Commission, acting in conjunction with other agencies at the federal and local levels, to vastly improve efforts related to education on safe sleep practices. Our own review of CDC data indicates it is a difficult challenge to reach new caregivers who rapidly transition into and out of periods of time caring for newborns and infants. While challenging, it is increasingly important to focus on behavior and use conditions in the care of newborns. JPMA will happily partner in all efforts related to safe sleep education. In conclusion, JPMA is not aware of any new science that would justify a ban on this product category since the 2016 CPSC report and notes that the current ASTM standard has effectively removed hazardous pillow-like bumpers from the marketplace, dramatically reducing any risks associated with the product. We appreciate and share your interest in child safety and we welcome the opportunity to have a collaborative dialogue about ways to educate parents and caregivers about proper selection and use of juvenile products, including crib, crib pumper, bumper pads and liners. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Shears. Now, I'm, you know, I have trouble walking and chewing gum at the same time. What am I supposed to do for the presentation? Is it on this computer? I got it, I got it for you. Oh. Talk to the gentleman next yeah. to you. <laughs> the screen server just came on, but I'll stick here. They miss you too. Barb, could you bring me another phone? This one just died. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with this. No, there it goes. He had to go and fix it back in the uh, room back there. We're not going to stock start the clock until you're ready and I think I hear a, an unmuted phone again so may I urge whoever is there with an unmuted phone to mute it
Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. My, uh, I'm N.J. Shears. I was a staff ma member of CPSC for 26 years. I miss you guys. Uh, and I thank you for letting me review crib bumper deaths. So my purpose is to compare the, the staff's review of bumper deaths with diagnoses by the medical examiner and pathologist. Uh, there were 43 deaths that they evaluated in 2016 that Brad Thatch and I also evaluated and uh, were published in the Journal of Pediatrics. Before I go on, though, I'd like to talk about the suffocation mechanisms. Uh, the first and most frequent is wedging, uh, where the uh, infant gets stuck between two surfaces and can't get out. If you remove one of those surfaces, like the crib bumper, the wedging doesn't occur. The second mechanism is face against the bumper without um, wedging. It's called lethal rebreathing. Uh, so as the infant uh, breathes into soft bedding, oxygen gets depleted, carbon uh, dioxide accumulates, and the infant rebreathes the carbon dioxide and suffocates. The third method is strangulation. When bumper ties, there's very few, and we won't talk about them here. Now, the team uh, at CPSC evaluated those deaths and disagreed with the medical examiner on 34 deaths, agreed on three deaths, and agreed on six deaths that the medical examiner called SIDS. Uh, Brad Thatch and I reviewed those six deaths and thought they were likely to be suffocations, but you know, that was not medical examiner diagnosis. So I'd like to tell you why I think the best evidence for how the deaths occur from the medical examiners. One is they're on the spot. They're there when the deaths occur, and CPSC can review those years later. Some of them are years old. Uh, the ME's investigators do the scene. They ask the parents to place the doll the way they've seen, um, the way they found their infant, and they also do the medical examiners do the autopsies, and CPSC staff disagree with those diagnoses from the autopsies. So the Emmys are the primary source of the data. Uh, they do the autopsies, the investigations, the death certificate. They are the official word. Uh, and so CPSC is reviewing information primarily from the medical uh, examiners. Often they said the uh, data was unclear or conflicting, but to my knowledge, they did not contact the medical examiners to talk to them to ask why uh, or what was uh, going on. <clears throat> Finally, um, the ME and pathologists are physicians. They're trained in, uh, they have specialized training in uh, diagnosing manner and cause of death. Uh, and CPSC staff is, does not have that specialized training, and there are no physicians on CPSC staff. So what I'd like to do now is go through about seven cases, depending on my time, and um, <clears throat> these are cases where I put on the slide for your reference uh, quotes from the death certificate, autopsy, and investigation. I'm not going to go through those. But I'm simply going to try to say what was the logic that the staff used to come to their conclusion. Uh, in this case, they said they didn't know if the bumper caused the death. And the logic was uh, there's no autopsy. Well, there was because when I was on staff, I put it in the databases. Uh, the baby was sick, uh, but the pediatrician uh, said the illness wasn't severe enough to cause his death. And finally, that this seven-month-old was developmentally capable of moving its head and getting fresh air. But that ignores the arousal literature. Hannah Kenny at Harvard studied SIDS brains and found an arousal deficit. So if this baby had an arousal deficit, it would not have moved its head. 
In this case, uh, the team said it was unlikely that the uh, bumper caused the death. Uh, and uh, the logic was the police and the father did not say the baby was wedged, but the medical examiner did. Well, this is a kind of wedging. It is two surfaces. The pocket is deep enough that the baby gets into that pocket and can't turn its head. So it is a form of wedging. Uh, they also said the blanching and lip lividity patterns suggest, clearly suggest that the infant was horizontal, uh, prone horizontal on the surface and face down. We would argue that the blanching lividity uh, it could also say the baby was prone, but faced to the side. And they felt that this soft padding was, uh, the dent in the padding was likely incidental, and of course we disagree with that. In this case, <clears throat> it, they felt it was unknown if the bumper caused the death. This was a wedging. The wedging was between the nursing pillow and the bumper, and they said, well, the baby's face, uh, we don't know if it was into the pillow or into the bumper. Well, it's a wedging. It doesn't matter. If the baby's face is into the nursing pillow and the crib bumper is keeping it there, if you remove the crib bumper, there won't be a wedging. And the death won't occur. This is another unknown where the staff felt that there was a comforter and they didn't know where the comforter was. Was the baby's face pressed into the comforter or into the bumper? But in the case files, the medical examiner uh, noted the comforter but didn't say it was contributory in any way. But again, uh, staff didn't call the medical examiner to clear this up. Uh, another, we don't know why the baby died, uh, and, oh, excuse me, this was summarized in the 2016 paper with some others, but it, it was said there that they, we don't know the orientation of the face relative to the bumper. Um, uh, clearly, the medical examiner said, decedent found in crib with face between bumper pad and mattress. But I put this up for another reason. Uh, in the 2013 report, there was um, a lot of mention of clutter in the crib, and there was a lot of clutter in the crib. No one likes clutter. We, we want to get it out of there, of course. But if the clutter is not between the nose and the mouth and the bumper, it's irrelevant for that particular death. Uh, again, uh, we don't know, uh, let me see, we don't know the exact position of the baby's face, uh, but again, we didn't communicate with a medical examiner or pathologist to find out why they said what they said, face wedged against bumper and mattress of crib. This is the last case, and this is one where the staff, uh, I think, misinterpreted the picture. That is not a death scene recreation. That is a picture of the death scene, but not a recreation. I called uh, the medical examiner and talked to her, and she said they never took a recreation picture. So, uh, and in 2013, uh, the staff said uh, they were entrapped, the baby was entrapped by a sleep positioner with back towards a bumper covered crib side. Uh, that is not correct, according to the medical examiner. And so, um, our recommendations are to ban these padded crib bumpers. Uh, we think the staff analysis is flawed. Uh, the medical examiners diagnosed a lot more uh, deaths of suffocation than the CPSC staff. The staff didn't communicate with the medical examiners or pathologists when the information was conflicting or unclear. And we think the best evidence for suffocation is from the medical examiners. Okay, and now, sir, if you could help me to another <laughs> presentation. We now have Brad Patch. Can you, could you get me up with another uh, one? 
Let, let me ask our tech person, Rock, if you could come out and set up Dr. Thatch's slides. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Right here. Thatch. Yep. Should be Thatch. Yes. Okay. So you're going to be changing the slides for Dr. Thatch? I am. Okay, good. Uh, Dr. Thatch, if you're there, uh, we look forward to your testimony. Another database, the National Center for Fatality Review and Prevention, is Abby Collier. Can you hear me? Yes. Showed in her talk, identifies more crib bumper deaths than the CPSC. CPSC did not include these deaths from the National Center in their review. There were 37 states in the National Center's network from 2008 to 2011. There were reports of 32 deaths from these states. From the same time period, 2008 to 2011, CPSC has 13 reports of bumper deaths, primarily from death certificates certificates collected from all 50 states. All three deaths were from the same states. Combining these deaths from those uh, two sources increases the number of crib bumper deaths to 42 for the time period 2008 to 2011, over three times the number of deaths identified by the CPSC. Then combining the 42 deaths with the 35 deaths we identified before 2008 results in a total of 77 deaths. Further, the count would be even higher if the National Center had cases before 2008. The CPSC's firmness test is not unreasonable, but there is no data on how firm the bumpers would have to be to prevent carbon dioxide accumulation of concern this, uh, is that babies tend to accumulate carbon dioxide uh, and lethally reduce oxygen around the baby's uh, face quickly and easily. In 1998, the CPSC staff used a mechanical test to measure rebreathing in comforters and found infants could have died while rebreathing. Also, the firmer the bumper the more likely it is to occlude the baby's face. In 1998, the health science uh, laboratory staff used a mechanical model to measure carbon dioxide accumulation and lethally reduced oxygen in comforts. They concluded their test showed infants could have died while rebreathing. Let's see, is that all I have? No, uh, something else. We concluded a uh, conduct a survey of mothers who subscribe to parent, uh, Parenting Magazine. This is NJ and myself. About 17% use crib bumpers, 20% mesh liners, and 63% use no barrier in the crib. There were too few mothers who said they used vertical bumpers to analyze. Mothers were asked to rate the items and why they use crib bumpers, mesh liners, or nothing in the crib. Almost the rating ranged from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Almost 60% of mothers who use crib bumpers use them because they are safe, with almost 90% doing so to prevent slide entrapment or heads or hit heads against the uh, slats. Flat entrapment and hit heads are more likely to occur in older children. At least 50% of mothers who did not use a crib bumper or mesh liner in the crib also worried about slat entrapment and hit heads. Therefore, the data suggests that mothers are unlikely to heed labels to remove crib bumpers for older children. I'm sorry. This and uh, recommendation that we made is there is substantially more deaths from crib bumpers than have been found in CPSC databases. The proposed firmness test is unproven. 
while waiting to determine if the firmness test is effective, more deaths will likely occur. 12 years and also 12 years of warnings have not reduced uh, crib bumper deaths. So that's all I have to say. Well, we thank you for that. And uh, we now have moved to uh, asking questions, and I will uh, lead with questions. And Dr. Dickerson, I did want to uh, note that I saw you on a Netflix uh, a documentary talking about uh, tip overs, and I thought you did a marvelous job. So, again, another good job today. I guess Thank my you. question to you would be uh, do you have any data that is, does Consumer Reports have any data or opinion? about the usefulness of mesh liners or vertical vertical crib bumpers? Uh, so we have no data specifically on vertical crib bumpers. Uh, we don't have data explicitly on mesh liners. However, it's something that we are considering uh, during our next fiscal year as something to uh, investigate. Well, we certainly appreciate that. Ms. Mariotti, uh, first of all, I want to express my appreciation to you and JPMA for the cooperative approach uh, through ASTM and directly with us that we've had over the years. We certainly want that to continue, and we thank you for your testimony today. Uh, you do point out that there's been quite a delay in the development of a standard. Uh, as you can see from the discussion today, it's a highly contentious issue. Uh, that's not necessarily a defense, so what I usually invoke is the three-part rule, good, quick, cheap, pick two. Uh, <laughs> and so it, it's, it's something we should be moving more quickly on, and I certainly appreciate your comment there. One of the points that you made uh, about removing crib bumpers from the market is what you call the unintended consequence of parents using dangerous soft bedding uh, as makeshift barriers. And I guess my question is, is that a theoretical uh, concern? Is, do you have data that supports that notion one way or the other? It's, it's not an insignificant concern. I'm just wondering what the basis is for making that assertion. Mm -hmm. So the um, assertion, as I cited it in my testimony, is from the CPSC staff briefing package. Um, it's also something that anecdotally is discussed in a variety of contexts related to sleep and even other types of children's products. In terms of the um, data as to parents using these items and how they're using them, uh, most of that comes from reviewing incident reports and seeing that these other products are present um, in, in the environment regardless of the, of the um, product that, that is under discussion or the type of, of death we're talking. Um, but in terms of hard data as to how many people do this and what's the inclination to do it, it doesn't exist. I do note, however, though, that when we look at pictures, um, these very troubling pictures of these death scene investigations, in most cases there are a variety of products um, implicated. And I think that we can draw a conclusion from that that it is not an uncommon occurrence. Uh, thank you for that. Dr. Shears and Dr. Thatch, and I'll start with Dr. Shears. Uh, one of the confounds I think I mentioned earlier this morning, when we're looking at uh, uh, deaths in cribs, is the issue of soft bedding versus crib bumpers. And you addressed it to some extent, but I'm wondering, to what extent do you think that's a serious confound? To what extent do you think that crib bumpers by themselves present a hazard? Uh, and do you have any uh, suggestions about how we can uh, assess the data um, more accurately? Well, the last part, no. The data is the That's data. That's what I was You're afraid I'd hear. stuck yes. with that. Uh, the, the, to me, the death is, I'm not a medical person, uh, and uh, I don't claim to be, so I'm not going to get into uh, some of that, but to me, if it, it, the, the, these are the only holes that you can use with, to, to get suffocated. So if, if the product is here and it's, a clutter is there, that's, uh, I would argue that that is the bumper and not the clutter. Is it your suggestion that uh, when staff is looking at the fatality reports that to the extent they can, they should contact the medical examiner to make sure that, that we've gotten at least their best assessment about what occurred with respect to a fatality? Or is that yeah. a resource drain of major proportion? 
It is a resource drain, uh, certainly, because when I was asked to take a fresh look at uh, the data, uh, what I found was our files were very sparse. And so I got a list of, and, and we called the medical examiners. They're very helpful. They give you anything. I say, give me whatever you got in your files. Uh, but uh, some things are offline, so to speak, and the medical examiner remembers them, but they didn't write them down. So yeah, I think it's critical to talk to them if something's conflicting or unclear. And if it's clear, you don't have to call, but certainly if it's conflicting or unclear, you should call. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, just out of curiosity, based on your assessment of the data, do you have a sense, uh, either based on data or just an impression, whether uh, deaths associated with crib bumpers are staying stable or increasing or decreasing? Well, when we did the 26 uh, paper, we saw an increase, but we couldn't, um, we couldn't con over time, we're not sure what it was. It could be just better reporting because people know we're interested, or CPS, I'm not we anymore, but CPSC is interested in it, and they'll just report more often. Uh, in your 2015 paper, you point out that infants still manage to get stuck in crib bumpers either by putting their legs over or under the bumper. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of the frequency of this? Did you have any hard data? Or it's just It seemed to be an interesting observation that I hadn't seen yeah. before. Uh, no, I don't have a uh, hard day. I, what we did was that's in the complaint database where people call in and say, this is what happened to my infant and I want to complain to CPSC. But there's no way to get any kind of estimate of the extent of that. It just happens, so one should know. Uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Thatch, um, if I understood correctly, uh, you have said that uh, you did have the ability to compare, at least to some extent, the data from CPSC from the data for the National Center for Fatality Review and Prevention. What's your best sense about the degree of overlap? What's your best sense of about the number of instances of fatalities that they have versus the number of fatalities that we have? Uh, well, that's not quite uh, uh, fair for Dr. Thatch because oh, well, whoever. <laughs> I, I, I did that, and uh, I uh, so. This was uh, in the 2013, I believe. Um, and at that time, Terry Covington was head of the National Center. And I called her, and she uh, said, well, the only way we can compare is to look at the states. And she went and did all, all the due diligence of getting the state's permission. So that's what we did. So in this figure, what you see is from 28 to 2011, there were only 13 deaths at CPSC. Uh, and from the National Center, there were 32 deaths from CPSC. Only three deaths were from the same states. So uh, this is, I think, um, incredible, because if you add all of this together and you get to 77 deaths, we don't know how many deaths are out there is what it comes down to, is we just don't know. But it's a lot more than we thought. Uh, I'm intrigued that uh, we, the staff didn't include uh, data from the National Center. Do you have a sense of why that is? Uh, is there a concern about the lack of quality of the data? Would you... Well, it's a, it's a lot of work. I mean, the staff does a lot of work. I, I, I don't know why they didn't contact the center. Uh, one final question, do you, uh, or Dr. Thatch, do you have an opinion about the uh, merits of mesh liners or the merits of uh, vertical liners as uh, products on the market? Well, I, I think mesh liners are fine. I don't think they uh, impose any additional hazards. Uh, and vertical liners, would it be the same assessment, same conclusion? Uh, I would say so, yes. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, those are all the questions that I have. Uh, Commissioner Kay, if you're now prepared to ask questions, forgive me for calling on you prematurely. That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to start with uh, Ms. Mariotti. Thank you for appearing. You, I think if I understood correctly, you talked about the fact that there's ongoing work at ASTM 
on airflow and trying to come up with a technical with technical requirements for that. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. Um, there have been some studies um, done by independent organizations to assess airflow in um, cloth bumpers as well um, as some of the other products that have been discussed today. In addition, as we heard earlier, there is an airflow requirement in a different ASTM standard, and that work continues. It's the um, ASTM is expressed as a group that next round, um, that's a requirement that they're hoping to incorporate into the bumper standard. I see. So where we had left it with ASTM, at least my understanding was, ASTM had, cre had created two task groups, one on firmness and one on airflow. And from what the staff had reported to us was that the airflow task group felt that it had not really found anything worth pursuing and had closed out its work. And so if that's accurate, it sounds though that that has been reopened. My understanding of the process as it stands is that that work was delayed in large part because the ASTM standard for um, lack of forward progression was at risk of being withdrawn entirely, meaning we would have to start over. And the group believed that the importance of this work and having a standard that could then be referenced as part of a federal rule um, justified forward movement on the areas where there is align, uh, alignment and data supporting um, the recommendations that are being worked into the standard and that more work needs to be done on the permeability question and so it was set aside for future rounds. I see. So do you have any sense of the timing as to when we might actually see specific proposed test requirements? I do not have an idea of that timing. Again, we are one of many stakeholders, but it is something that is discussed um, and certainly something that we promote for further discussion. Got it. Thank you. And Dr. Dickerson, if you wouldn't mind please following up on that topic, either within the context of work with ASTM or otherwise, do you know if CR has any data on airflow or test methods that would be helpful, or is that something CR would consider working on if not? So uh, as of today, we have no uh, research data or testing data uh, associated with airflow uh, or permeability. Uh, however, given the, the state of affairs, it's something that we are uh, very keenly considering uh, for future investigation. Great. To the extent that it matters, uh, we'd certainly support that very much. I think that would help significantly in this area. Uh, Dr. Thatch, I know you're on the phone as well as I am. Thank you so much for your pioneering work in this area, which is the reason we're even here today, uh, this 13 years or so after you originally published your study. So we're grateful that you're still involved in it. And of course, Dr. Shears, it's great to hear your voice again back at the agency and welcome back. I wanted to follow up on something that you were discussing with Chairman Adler, which is this uh, very disconcerting, it sounds like data gap, where there might be uh, full or relatively full files associated with bumper-related deaths that our agency really has not gotten its hands on. And so could you elaborate, please, Dr. Shears, a little bit more on what it would take for us to get a hold of those? files and what kind of assessment we would need to do on them. If you're talking about the National Center's file, uh, I think Abby Coleman said that um, uh, there is some problem in terms of getting uh, the de-identified data. Uh, I would have no idea. I'm not uh, part of the center, so you'd have to talk to Abby. But certainly you guys were able to get your hands on enough information to conclude that there were a number of deaths outside the scope of what the staff has looked at, correct? Well, no. All we did because of the confidentiality agreements, uh, we couldn't look at the cases. And so uh, all we did was say, well, let's get an idea of how to combine these by looking at what states the deaths occur. And the assumption was, if it was in a different state, it was not. Uh, it was a unique death, and if it was in the same state, it was uh, the same death. 
well, that's a little uh, loosey-goosey, but it gave us an idea that CBSC was not getting this data. Just 32 deaths versus 13 deaths tells you that. I see. Okay, well, it sounds like at a minimum then that there, it might be worth our staff at least taking another shot at trying to yeah. get some of this data, understanding that there might be difficulties with working with each individual state. I have no more questions, and thank you to the panelists, and thank you, Chairman Adler. Uh, thank you, and Commissioner Biacco. Thank you. Um, Dr. Shears, I wasn't here when you were here, so um, I'm sorry I missed you, and thank you for your service. Uh, what did you do when you were here? Uh, a number of things. I started off in epidemiology, and then I went to planning and evaluation, uh, and then uh, I went up to, oh, I've forgotten the other office so, <laughs> so soon. Uh, but I moved around. Okay. Is your, your background is in statistics, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I just had a couple point, uh, questions because I got a little bit confused on the um, uh, data that you were talking about and what um, with the center. I, I thought that Ms. Collier had said earlier that the, the CPSC and the center didn't necessarily compare data. Is that no, your? No, they don't. Okay, so it, it, so I, I think. Uh, so what you're saying is because they didn't compare the data, you added them together, assuming they were separate deaths? Yes. I mean, we wanted to get an idea of how many deaths were out there. And the only way, and we knew the center was getting more than CPSC was getting, so that's the only way we could add them was to look and see what states were the deaths occurring in. And if it was in the different states, we said, okay, we'll assume they're different deaths. Okay. If they're in the same states, we'll assume they're the same states, so we'll subtract those out, okay. and then we'll just have the unique deaths for the center and for CPSC. Okay, so you made some assumptions. What's the um, you know, plus and minus margin of error in the numbers? <laughs> oh, you're getting too smart. Uh, I have no idea. Okay. Uh, but deaths are counts, and you don't generally do plus or minus. Well, so on that note, wanna, I don't, I don't want to pick at your slides um, because no, I know no, that. Please. Yeah, no, I, I don't want to go do that because I, I, I think that in some of these cases, um, there are different um, conclusions. Would you agree with me mm -hmm. to reach? Okay. Sure. So the one, the one that I did want to ask you about, though, is you, um, you remember the slide that had the nursing pillow in it? Yes. Okay. So I, you said if you remove the um, crib bumper, there's no more wedging. Right. But if you remove the nursing pillow, the same, there would be no more wedging as well. Absolutely. So it could be either or. Yes. Or a combination of both. We just don't know. Just all you need is one. Okay. So it could have been the other. Yeah. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that um, medical examiners um, are, you, you like to rely on them because they're MDs, but um, wouldn't you agree that medical examiners are, are, can be in certain jurisdictions elected officials who aren't physicians? No, those are coroners. We have a medical examiner coroner system, and that's why I had in the slides ME slash pathologists, because the coroners have to have a pathologist. They can't do the autopsies. And they can't do the, uh, they, they, the official uh, diagnosis comes in from the pathologist. So you're right, the coroner can be anybody, Joe, Joe Smo, but, um, uh, but they have to have a pathologist. Okay. So when you said you picked up the phone and talked to these people, did you talk to the coroner or the medical examiner? I just got confused on what you said. Uh, no, uh, I guess the people I did talk to happened to be medical examiners. Uh, when I had a question. Okay, that, that's a, I just wanted to clear that up. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's I think that's all I have right now. Th thank you. Okay. Um, working backwards, Ms. Ms. Mariotti, um, you indicated uh, first of all, um, I don't know what's taken so long, and I must confess that it, I'm not a big fan of the speed in which government. <laughs> That's been one of my biggest frustrations coming from private practice. How slow everything is. So I I, I feel your pain. I think we all do. And you mentioned, uh, just on that point, that we should be working with other, uh, other agencies to get that message out. They ain't going to speed things up either. But uh, your point is well taken. Um, but on that point, um, you, you mentioned that um, 
uh, JPMA is part, partnering with different agencies, including the CPSC, uh, w with regard to safe sleep. What are you doing um, as far as getting that message out, and what kind of, um, how, how did you measure, if at all, your success getting that me message out? Um, so we have, as have you, been in contact with a variety of different agencies. And I think that we will all agree that getting the message out is very, very challenging, in large part because we don't have a consistent message, part of the reason that we're here today. Part of the reason that we would like to see a uniform national standard on this topic, because consistency in messaging is certainly going to lead to better efficacy. Um, we are able to um, track um, certain behaviors um, through data that is widely available um, where we do see that messages such as back to sleep do continue to resonate. Um, we also work with our manufacturers to promote safe sleep messaging and in a very grassroots way often um, several manufacturers do have their own initiatives where they um, go into communities and work through different nonprofits to donate cribs, um, talk about safe sleep, talk about ways to um, best practices in terms of, of safe sleep messaging. Um, but we do believe that, that uniform standards do help um, tremendously so that we're all speaking the same language when we go out there in the world and, and spread the word. Are you working with the medical community at all? We would love to work more with the medical community. Certainly, we keep um, an open dialogue mm -hmm. um, as much as possible. Um, as you can see today, sometimes we, we don't um, agree on the analysis of the data or the, the way forward, even if we do agree on the data sets and the progress. But certainly, um, JPMA always supports campaigns that um, that encourage safe sleep practices. We always support the NIH recommendations um, and again work with a number of different partners um, and always like to try to keep that dialogue open. I'm a big advocate of starting in the middle because I believe that no matter how um, uh, diverse views are, there is a middle and we can all agree on and, and to start there. So I, I would hope that um, on this issue or any other issue that we have diverse views, we could start and at least move the issue forward as far as the things that everyone does agree with. Because listening today, I, 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 I've walked away with things that I think everybody agrees with. So I, I would encourage you to, to start there. Um, on the, um, uh, the ASTM thing, you, you said, uh, and I hope I got this right, that our position is that um, ASTM F1917-12 um, should address many of the issues. Is, is that right? Mm -hmm. So that is correct. So we believe that um, Dash 12 addresses many of the issues. It addresses um, the concerns raised by Dr. Thatch in his original report. I'll also note that um, just from the visuals, at least five of um, the pictures of the cases that Dr. Shears showed us today, um, those products would be banned under the currently ex existing standard. And I think as we look at data um, and hear about some of these, these deaths and, and flush out perhaps additional data sets, that we're very mindful of those that come prior to some of the work that's already been done. Um, because I do think that the products that were implicated in many of the older data sets are already not in the marketplace and that we need to move forward um, from a place of better and, and more stringent regulation as justified um, as with any product category. Well, that brings me to my next question, and this is a concern I have not with the, the product we're discussing today, but all products, and that is how do we police um, online compliance? Because I think another, um, if you will, vulnerable population that we um, uh, discuss matters with are the people who think what they're buying online is coming from this organization or that organization when it's not. And we do know, we all know, that we're getting products shipped directly to a consumer's home that are not coming from uh, manufacturers or sellers that are complying with the standards. How do we deal with that? Uh, we could have another hearing on that topic. Um, I can tell you that topic is a major agenda item of JPMAs as well. And it is a very complex issue for the reasons that you note. Um, we believe that a good start are programs like the JPMA certification program that is a additional verification that third party testing has been completed, um, that the products are compliant with all federal rules and are sold by reputable sellers into the marketplace. Um, we're looking at other types of programs that would have similar checks and balances so that 
those products that are compliant are, are what's being sold and that those products that are not compliant would be more easily identified. Yeah, I'd be interested to know, and maybe this is not the right product, but um, if any of the deaths um, had anything to do with a, uh, a seller who was not satisfying any of the standards, um, and maybe not applicable here, but it is something I think we should consider. I think my time is up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be brief, but I, I wanted to again express my appreciation for all of you being here and for uh, Dr. Thatch for, for being available on the telephone. Um, I want to make sure that we're asking the right questions about the data. It's been a, a, a focus of most of the discussion for what's been a, a, a long day, and I'm glad that we've had the opportunity to go into this level of depth. Um, but under our requirements, if we were to pursue a product ban under Section 8, we're, we're supposed to look at the unreasonable risk of injury associated with that product. Um, if we were to pursue a durable nursery standard under Section 104, again, that's a risk-based inquiry where we're looking at the risk of injury associated with that product. When we're talking about making a risk assessment, much of the discussion today has been focused on aggregate incident counts. Um, and each one of those incidents is, is heartbreaking. And um, all of those fatalities are, 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 are important, in particular to the families that experience them. Um, but going through the analysis that the agency needs to conduct, looking at risk, what I'm not hearing today, it's much discussion in terms of exposure rates. Um, the data set that we're talking about is over uh, a multi-decade period of length, going back 30 plus years. Um, I'm not hearing much discussion about uh, the, the incident rates in terms of exposure, in, in terms of the number of product in the marketplace. Is that a necessary part of this conversation? Um, Ms. Mariotti, I'll, I'll turn that over to you. So we would say yes, certainly that it is. Um, and I think coupled with, with my prior point about um, the way the product has evolved since the time that we started looking at these incidents, that exposure not just to the product as a general concept, but the product as it exists today in compliance with the current ASTM standard and certainly um, as has moved towards the anticipated um, additional requirements. Um, I think that um, Using the precautionary principle um, is not founded in this case, but certainly um, is, is what's being advocated, I think, by, by some of my colleagues that have spoken today um, versus really using the scientific data to make an analysis of how to proceed. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, th this question is for uh, Dr. Shears and, and Dr. Thatch. Um, in your review of the data, and this is going back to a question I've asked on, on the two previous panels, do you see anything that speaks to the efficacy of the Maryland state ban? Uh, not in our data, but there was a study uh, that looked in, I guess, the Northeast, and it was uh, use of the data. And the lowest was Maryland. The highest was New York, New Jersey. Uh, so th that would be the only... Uh, literature I'm aware of. Would you mind submitting that for the record so I'd have an Certainly. opportunity to review? Thank you. Um, if I may, Commissioner Feldman, yes, because Maryland has come up many times today, there was an article in the Baltimore Sun in March of 19, um, which I will submit as part of our, our record. Um, there is not um, data attached to it or a study, but the title of the article is Baltimore Just Saw the Worst Spike of Sleep-Related Infant Deaths Since 2009. Um, I think that digging into that information might be compelling given the, the amount of um, reliance we seem to be putting on, on or questioning about the efficacy of the Maryland ban. I appreciate it. Would you mind submitting that for the record as of well? Course. Thank you. Um, and, and I think this is my last question, um, and it's a little bit off topic, uh, but, but uh, Ms. Mariotti, given your experience with the, the ASTM standards development process, um, when CPSC staff participates in voluntary standards development, there's a number of criteria that it needs to consider uh, before it can in participate in the process. And, and that includes taking a look at um, some of the sa procedural safeguards that are in place with respect to the SDO process period, or with, res with respect to some safeguards within the standard, looking at things like whether the standard excludes to the mass maximum extent possible 
um, requirements that would have an anti-competitive effect um, or that would create a restraint, restraint of trade within um, market actors that are trying to meet that safety standard. Mm -hmm. And likewise, whether the, the standard itself has a mechanism for periodic review to make sure that anti-competitive effects either aren't present or, or, or have been uh, addressed and, and there's sort of a, a relief valve on, on that front. Mm -hmm. um, these effects, in, in my view, tend to be exacerbated when uh, you have industry stakeholders that are participating in the, the development process that own the particular IP that then becomes sort of the basis for the performance requirement. Um, and, and we heard from uh, uh, panelists on the previous panel uh, that, that do own IP in this space and that are actively uh, participating in, in, in the development process. Um, with your participation in ASTM, in your view, are there safeguards in place to address those concerns? Yes, we believe they are, and I think that the current cases are um, excellent examples of, of that scenario. And by um, working through an industry association such as JPMA, we can have open dialogues um, with some of those stakeholders to ensure that we're not crafting regulation that would infringe upon um, a certain organization's IP or create a scenario where there is a monopoly. Um, we think that it's been very effective. Um, certainly using performance-based standards um, is, is the way around that versus referencing certain proprietary terms or even um, terms of common use that would um, lean towards infringing on a, certain, on a certain type of IP. But as long as the standards are performance-based, um, typically we're able to navigate those waters, and I do find that we do so pretty effectively. That's helpful background, and I appreciate that. I want to thank you all again for being here. Um, well, I want to thank all of our panelists and everyone who helped facilitate the meeting. Uh, Rock, our technician, has done yeoman's work in keeping us on track, so we really appreciate that. Uh, this concludes this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Again, thank everybody who appeared.